Japan for taping the meeting. Um, any public comment? <laughs> Student report. Hi, Summer. Hi, Warren. Good. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah. Yep. What do you have to tell us? Um, just two things. Really, DECA just finished their um, first big event, and I thought that was pretty important to cover because almost every student made it to the second round Great. in the class. Yeah, really impressive. So I talked to a couple of my friends um, who do it. A lot of them do it, and they said that DECA is probably one of the best classes that they've taken throughout high school, nice. um, and that it's a lot of like life skills, um, things that they can use, um, and they said that they would recommend it to all underclassmen if you're interested in going into that business field. And they said that it's not as stressful as you think, like going in and presenting in front of people can be kind of nerve wracking, mm -hmm. especially if it's your first time, you don't really know what to do. But um, she said that Mr. Martino really like helps you understand what's going on and what to do. Um, and I thought it was pretty impressive that almost everybody that went made it to the second round. Um, so I think that maybe if we could have maybe the underclassmen hear a little bit more about it mm -hmm. because how great it's doing and how important it is, especially because business is such an up, up and coming um, field. And then the second one was no more midterms. <laughs> um, so I asked probably more than half of my grade and then a couple of juniors and sophomores. I was like, hey, did you guys not, uh, were you happy with not having mid midterms this year? And everybody's response was, really, Summer, you think we wanted to sit for a week and take tests? And I was like, <laughs> Yes, um, that's true. Um, but honestly, everybody said that they don't like the no midterms, but what they thought was really helpful was all the teachers this year, instead of doing midterms, at the end of each quarter, you have a quarter test. So everything that you did that quarter, you cover in that test. Mm -hmm. So it's not compact into that one final midterm, um, besides foreign language, because you have to speak and um, keep up to date with that. But they thought that that was really helpful because you actually got to learn the information better than having to learn all of it in that one semester and then studying for the things that you don't really know and then you go and you're like, oh, I didn't study everything. And mm -hmm. um, they thought that how we're doing that this year was a lot more helpful than in the past. And the freshmen seemed to, because um, again, I TA the math class and all the freshmen seemed a little more relieved. They're like, I can't believe you guys had to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody missed the um, week, of week of school with like three hours of school a day. I know. Um, I actually didn't really mind it. I mean, we had a lot of Mondays off. This That's true. Week. It almost makes the weeks go by slower, too. Today it was dragging, especially with it raining and first week back, first day back for the week. But yeah, everything's been pretty positive up looking for the second semester. So. Can I ask a question about, um, so is there any day that you do like a a showcase or like a fair that's um, that's kind of highlighting extracurriculars so that everybody can go to like a, have a taste of what it's like to be on DECA or debate and just like an afternoon where you would just go to each one and see oh that's what that's all about. Um, since I've been in high school I haven't ever done that. I know that um, a couple of like the teachers so they when you say what class you want to go into next year, it's like honors math, CP math. You also say what elective you're interested in. And so Ms. Brown goes through all the math electives and tells you a little bit about them. But it's like really quick. So all the kids, unless you're like know anything about it, then you don't really get any sneak peek about it. But I think that would actually be really helpful because eighth graders go to that assembly, that mm -hmm. rising up assembly, yeah. where where upperclassmen speak about deck and debate and mm -hmm. paper. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when I was in eighth grade, we did, we walked through the classes and they showed you where all the classes was, like this is going to be your math hall, English, um, foreign language, but I don't think I ever learned like specific about the classes. I know that the guidance counselors like went through with you, <coughs> this is how you um, sign up for your classes, this is the type of classes, there's the whole um, like packet of like what type of classes you can take. Um, and that's actually pretty helpful. But I think like seeing it mm -hmm. and like hearing from actual students about it would be really helpful. That's a great idea, okay. um, especially the underclassmen too, because I have a son who's going through the whole elective thing because he just dropped something in his now. So many people were changing today. And he's like, I have no <laughs> idea what any of this is. Yeah. I don't even, I've been told there's no room in anything, so what's the point? And so he's kind of like, 
I don't even know what any of this is, but I feel like if they had a heads up on some of this, mm -hmm. they'd be able to make decisions ahead of time. And yeah, I think yeah. that's a great idea that you had exposing some of the, you know, underclassmen or even the kids in your own class to some of this. So yeah. I know what these exploratories are about because that's the whole idea. Even with them, like the seniors coming in and talking to like freshman classes or sophomore classes, like we all have free blocks now um, scattered through the whole day. So we could go in for the first like 10 minutes of classes and talk about them. Um, I didn't take that many electives because I doubled up in sciences the past three years. Um, so I didn't have the open blocks. But like a bunch of my friends like took music theory. I never even knew we had music theory and she loves it. Hmm. Um, Deco, obviously I hear, hear great things about it. My friend Katie actually doubled up in marketing classes this year with Mr. Martino because that's really what she wants to do. But there, I've heard great things about many different electives. Yeah, that's a good idea to try to figure out how to incorporate something like that. And maybe it's just as easy as the seniors coming in and talking to, you know, some of the UBOC classes. Is there any value th of throwing a, a, like, you know, this is the kind of work you would be doing? <coughs> you know what I mean? Just so you really know this is the level of rigor. So that it's one thing to say, even like in the high school, Welcome night, you know, when all the parents are there, you know, your eyes kind of glaze over because it's a data dump. Yeah, it's and like water through, right through a fire hose. But if someone made you do something at that level, it gives you a sense of, oh, you know, I don't know if I can handle this or if I want to meet that challenge. There's definitely some classes that kids went into. They're like, oh, I didn't know that there was going to be so much work. Yeah. Like this year, I'm taking human anatomy as like a science elective. I was like, oh, this is going to be great. Like, I'm kind of interested in the forensics. I was like, oh, this is a sneak peek. I went and I was like, oh my gosh, this is more work than half my other classes this year, which is totally work that I really like the class. But to know that ahead of time would have been awesome. Um, but other classes like women in engineer, it's new. I think this is mm -hmm. the second year. Um, so many kids like we're going up to Miss Brown. She's like, "Woman in engineer is that just for girls?" And she's like, "No, like it's for everybody." And it's a lot of like um, hands-on building. So uh, the end of the sem first semester, they built castles and then like projectile to see whose castle could stay up the longest. Or um, the classic the egg in the basket. What is that called? Trebuchet. Trebuchet. Trebuchet yeah. 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 Um, so I think it's really neat, and so it like covers everybody's grounds of what they're good at. Hands-on learners. Studying. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. So get the we need to get the word out on. Yeah. Yeah. And, and do some sort of fair, elective yeah. fair. Yeah. Fair yeah. or yeah. It was crazy. Like I was sitting in the guidance because my half my schedule got deleted for second semester somehow, and they're like, "We're not. You're not signed up for this class." I'm like, "It's a year round class, so I'm going to lock myself in for it." Um, so to go fit it. And like ten kids came in. They're like, "I don't know what elective this is." I'm like. Well, it's down in this hallway. They're like, really? I'm like, yep. <laughs> They're like, okay, thank you. I'm like, oh gosh, I'm sorry. Um, but they all like seemed happy about it. They just had no idea where it was. Some of them like, some of them just because if you don't get into your first level, do you get popped into the second? Because like some are so much popular than others. And I'm like, yeah, it's in this wing. They're like, I've never been down there before. Like the music one. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, it's right there. <laughs> um, but yeah, everything seems good right now. Oh, great. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Mm -hmm. Is Collett, is everyone hearing about, not Collett, they have heard about them at Christmas time, right? And now they're waiting for Regular March. Spring. Yeah, I'm, I committed tonight, actually. You did? You did? Uh, tonight? I'm going to see you, Boulder. Oh, so nice. Nice. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I awesome. got into my oh, program, so Can I come? I'm excited. Yeah, <laughs> feel free. What, what program? Um, I'm majoring in psychology and minoring in international affairs. Nice. Wow. Awesome. Yeah, so you yeah. Made a psychology degree. Boulder's interesting. Yeah, I never see like coming from the ocean. I never thought that I wanted to be landlocked, but like it's a whole new world out there. So pretty. And I'm outdoorsy, it. and everybody's so friendly. So I'm excited. That's, That's great. Crazy. great. It's a little crazy because it's reality now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Great summer. Congrats. Congrats. Thank you. Bye. Have a good rest of your night and right. meeting. I'll be over okay. in August with my bags and my skis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Summer. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. See you, Summer. Okay. Don't have anything for Chairman's report? Consent agenda. We have a motion to approve the consent agenda, which has the warrants, the minutes, and the trip approval. So if anyone has questions about that, let's just get the motion going. So moved. 
Second. Second. So that was Wolf and Weld. Weld. That one over there. Okay. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Sure. Um, so if we are approving travel for two teams and they're supposed to be fundraising, that's my question. And we just told a whole room of people last week. Yes. Two weeks ago. Yeah. Can so I jump in? Please. Uh, I, I noticed met, that that's here. So I'm I. Not I I met with the uh, lacrosse girls lacrosse coach and the baseball coach on Friday, and we talked about fundraising. And they have decided, and I'm happy to report that uh, they are waiving uh, the request to lift the policy. So um, the trip will be paid by parents and guardians. It won't, won't there won't be any fundraising. Okay. What about the boys baseball going to Cooperstown? Same thing. Same thing. Yeah. Okay. I hope that um, the athletic task force that. I'm representing the school committee and we'll discuss that policy. Oh yes, yeah, that's in part general. Of it. So yeah, absolutely. It's actually in the packet. This time. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Um, abstain? Great. Okay, so let's get to subcommittee reports. That's good. That's Simple. it. All right. You go. Oh, that was it. Thank, Thank you. you. God, no question. Jack and Ty and everything. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul. Um, okay, so elementary facilities, you want to do it? Sure. Great. Um, so we had a great meeting last night. Uh, we actually, just, one of the tasks we were set forth last night was to decide between team at risk versus design bid build. And unanimously, I think it was a unanimous vote to go with the CM at risk last night. And the pros, they really tried to present, they presented it as Switzerland. <laughs> um, and, you know, didn't want to steer us in one way or the other. Um, they tried to do the best they could there. Um, CM at risk definitely starts us off at a higher price point because you have to, I don't remember what the range is to hire them. So it starts out high, whereas design, bid, build will start out low, but with all the change orders you'll get over time. And then the CM at risk protects you and brings that all down. It kind of balances out in the wash in the end. Um, but they, you really got the feeling that they were advocating for it, and when it's a public project, it really makes sense to have um, a CM at risk, a co which it really is a construction manager at the table from the beginning, going through the process, especially when we have so much phasing, so they can kind of say, well, this will be this much money. So we went. Um, it's called CM at risk. At at risk. Okay. Construction okay. manager. Construction manager at risk. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we voted to go that route, um, and then. Can Jane, I just say one other thing mm -hmm. about this? I think that there were several things that were that because of the complexity of the site, because the site is so tight, they felt like for safety reasons, that, that was a really important um, mm -hmm. way to go, mm -hmm. that the, the construction manager really owns that piece of it, and so it's their problem that they have to solve, and it's their risk. Mm -hmm. So um, I know from the, when we built this building that we had building committee meetings or building committee members running this project every day. Or not every day, but every week they had meetings because there, nobody really owned it. And um, I think that there was, they also felt like there was a price that you put on and that they tried their best to make it within that price. And so it's on them to deliver. It's almost like not to exceed, right? And not to exceed price. That you've got to figure out how you're going to get this thing done at this price and within this time frame. So I think it was really, there was a, it was hard to find anyone to argue for the other side, and obviously you had some of Yeah, just the one other feature about it, when you do the procurement, um, it's based on qualifications rather than straight lowest price. In uh, the design bid build method, you have to make sure someone is eligible, uh, that they haven't disqualified them in some way, but then whoever's lowest, you must, by law, must go with them, whereas now you can say what the qualifications that you're looking for, and price is a factor but it doesn't have to be the deciding factor. Um, and again, the purpose in the end is that the money, you know, will be efficiently spent. So it's still obviously an important factor, but it doesn't have to be the one and only factor. Yes, and we had budgeted that in, the price, when we did our mm -hmm. original in mm -hmm. the feasibility, that, that 650, yep. that we had budgeted that in there, so it's not a surprise. We were banking in case we needed that money. They also said that um, change orders at days and so we'll see that risk you're married to the end date. And so for a project where you're moving kids around and need things to be completed by start of school and stuff like that, it's a, a good feature. Because um, not only do change orders drive up costs, they also usually have 
you know, and that will be one, two, three, four, five days plus money mm -hmm. on the change order. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. But you also get a few points for it was convincing. You're already right. a point and a half or something. Oh. Minuscule, but it's mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think the big picture was more their their goal is to maintain a reputation for tight project management and efficiency. And that's what they're that's what they're looking for in the end, where I think the builder is more about making money on the project and moving on to the next and less worried about coming in under budget and on time. So I thought that was kind of a because when you get kind of the details, you start to get lost between the two. Yeah. But it seems like they'll be more of an advocate for our project than an advocate for the particular company that might close to the project. Yeah, so they don't get their next business based on references. They get it on being the lowest price. So their incentive is to bid low, right. add change mm -hmm. orders, whereas these folks are in the business of getting references and being reviewed based on their qualifications. Mm -hmm. So that also aligns with our needs, I mm -hmm. think. That's exciting. Um, Good with that? Mm -hmm. And so we've got our community meeting uh, next Wednesday, which is the 31st. It's a half day of school. Um, not that that matters. I, just I didn't know that. Thank you. Um, and so we've got the morning session. So we need, if anybody wants to sign up, Andy's going to take the evening. I'm going to do the morning. And then we need definitely to have some school committee members there as well. So morning. Morning. Evening. 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 I think I can come in the morning. It's a half day K through eight. K through eight? Yeah. Okay, because high school just had theirs. I'm not yeah. yeah. No, I just thought it. Thank you. So you can do evening. evening. But I can probably do evening. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and then on the first, we are going over the, we've got one renovation, one ad renovation, and three or four news. Three, three news. news. But let's go, want to look at them and then let's just talk about what the, yeah, I think we should talk about what the conversation was Where'd and let, this will just be, right there. I'll just put them up here. So let's start with, where's the, where's the renovation? I think I didn't even bring it. Oh. oh, I don't, did I bring no. this? Did you not bring this? AR2? No, yeah. I don't think I did the, brought the R. So the renovation the is, same? imagine that it's the building it's as it is, just fixed up. Fixed up. And so, um, no one is really looking at that seriously because it, it looks like the upper right hand one. Mm -hmm. None of it doesn't meet our programming. Doesn't, it doesn't meet MSBA. Mm -hmm. But well, you just have to submit it, right? Because you have to submit you, yeah, you, you have to get a, an estimate yeah. on it. So we'll look at the estimate, but it doesn't meet the program. So it would be why would you invest all that money in something that doesn't meet your current program? It will cost similar to these. Because uh, that's what Charlie us. said. Maybe. Uh, that's this well, one. People may go, if, yeah. if, it, if it is a lower cost, people may they say, know, hey, this far. is the lowest bid, why didn't you take? So if there are caveats like not being kept accessible, mm -hmm. these are the... Well, everything has to be brought up to code, Yeah. but you're still spending a lot of money for the same building that doesn't, is, isn't meeting your needs now. Does that make sense? I, I hear you. I'm just, I'm just saying, point out what those critical flaws are. Yeah, like, but we have... still have a massive that. amount of exterior yep. space, you know, walls, ceiling, or walls, roof to maintain. Okay. So this is the first ad reno, and um, this is what it looks like at the end. The only ad reno that we're doing. And it's the only estimate that we're getting for ad reno. And um, I think there was a lot of interest in this, um, in this part of it. But this is all, um, what do you think? I'll you can That's the reno. Yeah. Who was interested? Um, somebody who has a gray sweater. Um, <laughs> over there, not this gray sweater. No. But um, and not that gray sweater. This, this is um, they they bumped out what the existing kitchen, the existing cafeteria, and what you need to remember is that this is all timber frame construction. So they would have to go back in and do seismic renovations and really beef this up. You would still have the same size gym. You would still have. The, you smaller. might have a smaller auditorium. Um, so it's spending a lot of money to fix up something that's not really meeting the need now. And it doesn't change the loop. The yeah. It doesn't address the parking or yeah. the um, drop off pickoff, pickup, yeah. which is a big driver. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> Pam and Avi, you have anything else to say about some of the strengths and weaknesses of this? I think the strength that we had, I had pointed out, was the separation between the community at the community space, right, and the rest of the building, mm -hmm. and the dedicated parking behind. Because if if you put your mind set into 
how to operate the building and let the community use it for all of the days it needs to. That really, yeah, it helps to just kind of yeah, segregate that out. And yeah. the cafeteria was on the. <coughs> and and this is the a practice classroom. field that um, they were able to squeeze in. That's the same field. No. no, no, that's a new. No, that's over here. That's new with the, the swing set and playground. Oh, okay. and I think some of the discussion is, can you get it big size. enough to be a practice size field? Yeah. Yeah. You can see Brook Street for size purposes. Oh, right here. Mm -hmm. It's pretty yeah. small. It's, it's, it's much smaller. No, I mean, as a practice. Yeah, 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 for practice. practice. You want to try to get up to a yeah. half field? Yeah. 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 And this is the second floor, and um, uh, you get K one pre K, K and one down here, and then two, three, and five. Two, two through five up here. Mm -hmm. Oh, so there's a second floor? Yeah. Mm -hmm. White Just hallways. in the wing. White hallways, you get a breakout space? Just in the wing. Yeah. Okay. Because the gym is double story. So Pam really liked the, I think you liked the layout of this. But and this is all brand new. Well, yeah. Yes. I right. like, can I, Pam really liked it when, the, I wanted to say one great thing about what JCJ and Durham Litter did at this meeting is they really listened to him. The school building committee from the last phase to last night's meeting and changed a lot of the floor plans to address <laughs> that concern. So this was a big, I think, big driver for you when it really could, when nothing else really cut off the community. Yes. But in these schemes now you have those options. So between of the last meeting, there was a design charrette. It was like the designers on the team met with um, the people from JCJ and then people gave feedback and they were great about kind of really listening to them made really nice adjustments and I think people feel better about the where we are with these last options. Okay. Annie, I thought it was really interesting the you know dropping in last night and not having been yeah. um, for a couple meetings is they went through the phasing for each yeah. school sport if you want to Oh yeah! Can you go through the phases? I think because that might be good just to set up. It's interesting. Right. So orange is is taking away. So blue stays. Blue is stays. So these are modulars that they would set up. Then they would take away these two wings, keeping the modulars. They build this this bit right. Take away that modular or take away these wings here. Then build this part. And then take that away over here, and then build this part. So that's. Phasing adds money. Many modulars, modulars adds, money. adds money. And this one has a lot of modulars. Yeah, and a lot of phases. So the construction manager at risk, one of the things that Tyler argues is that a construction manager will come in and say, you know what, I can do it this way. I can, I can help you with that phasing and then make it two, two phases or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons you would also want to have a CM um, on board earlier. The time phase, the time period from top to bottom is a year and a half. Or I don't, I, there's a, it depends on the. No it depends on the. The only other something. thing is that uh, modulars are non-reimbursable by MSBI. Mm -hmm. So and there's that's, that's another thing is, uh, yeah. a CM at risk can help you do is how do you minimize the use of modulars? I mean the designers are already thinking about that and coming up with plans, but they might have some additional. So this problems. has essentially 14 classrooms as modulars to put a number on. It's yeah. expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Yep. So the next one is the piano. I've got it up behind you if that's any easier. Yeah. Oh, okay. So piano. Okay. Um, so the piano is all blue. And then go to the next one. This is the phasing. Yep. So you take away orange, right? And you have your modulars. Two, what is that? Eight, 16. 16. Okay. Next. You build the whole building. Blue, white blue. Yep. Next, demolish that, and you're in. So, what we thought about this? Go to the next one, Pam. Nope, that didn't work. The conventional wisdom was that this was the least expensive, most efficient, because it's one square, right? And what we learned last night is that. <coughs> There's more gray in this building um, if you go to the floor plan. So you also look at the queuing, see how the for driveway comes in, you go around, you have a lot more space for cars to kind of line up, drop off and pick up, and then you go out there, there's more, there's more parking. So that's good, and you got a field. And that's not a regulation field. But there's a lot of room to roam. But she has lines in it. She said, don't pay attention to that. But it's a nice The one nice thing she did, because I think the main concern was that the gym was in the center of the building. And on the first um, iteration of this, it was all classroom or all rooms all the way around, so the kids would have to walk in circle. There was one, no easy way to get there. 
and it was very dark, so she added the cafeteria here. And there's no hallway up there. Right. You had to just go. With a lot of glass. Yeah, that's gray box gray is a hallway. Too. That's all hallway right there? Gray is no. hallway. Or no. stairway. No, no those are the mechanics. Dark gray is, yeah. You have to go to the next one, it goes in detail. Oh, okay. A little hard to read, but it. The pale gray is. This is the mechanical construction room yeah. here. No, I was wondering about the darker gray. And then this is the yeah. kitchen. Yeah. Stairwells, yeah. toilets. Those kinds of nuts. So things. what she did with this was she also made it accessible. So with this one, there was no way on election day for p parents and community members to come in to vote without ha being right in the heart of the building. Mm -hmm. And that's always a, a concern for families mm -hmm. because there's nervousness around a lot of Thank strangers you. coming in and out. So she did carve out um, a dedicated entryway that could you could lock off here. You can lock off. The, it, you know, you can lock off and direct them straight in, and just have the kids monitored when they're in the cap. But she also spun the um, gym, and I think <laughs> in a lot of these plants, she she turned them from, mm -hmm. um, and, and it was able to get the stage over here and the cafeteria. And then Alba had made a recommendation: why don't we um, swap them, mm -hmm. the cafeteria over there? I don't know what's going to happen with that, but. Um, when we went and looked at um, the Gloucester School, which was the Pumpkin. West Parish, the Gloucester oh, West, one. West, West Parish, sorry. It was small, like the mm -hmm. stage cafeteria area, which is where they have their performances, was small. And um, what they're trying to do is get, um, what is that called? Include the cafeteria. Side by side, what is that called? Adjacent. 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 Adjacency, so that you can put in um, well, paper partitions or something, so yes. you can open it all the way up, yeah. so we'll go kind of all three. Like I can't yeah. talk. Yeah, yeah. sorry. So that's a hallway yeah. there. Like charades. Yeah, yeah. Um, One syllable sounds like Yeah, that. but it, so you'll see that a lot of them have this kind of stage, gym, cafeteria, so that you can have more seating. Was this the one that they said was the, was the most compact, but yet the most square, square feet? Footage, yeah. mm -hmm. The least, the smallest footprint, footprint but the most square feet. Yeah. Because that's three stories. Because <coughs> everyone was like, the, the no, cheapskates, yeah, like stories. me, were like, this one. And it is, because of all the gray, all of the hallways, it's um, kind of expanded its square footage. What, um, what's the impact of having the gym with classrooms around it as far as noise and that sort of thing? They said that they can manage the, no the, the noise, but if, you know, you've been to any of the elementary schools that the doors open. Yeah. And so they, they strategically decide about doors because that's really where the sound leaks. Yeah. Yeah. If you're at the second floor where it's all walls, it, there's, there'll be nothing because they all sorts of treatments they can do. And we actually saw that at the West Parish School, lots of treatments. But Treatments with like soundproofing? Mm -hmm. okay. so but if it, the doors are, you know, so I think one of the things they talked about actually last night was they put the doors around things that might be, uh, not classrooms, but more in other areas. So I can't remember where they were talking about. One by the cafeteria. Yeah, yeah they're going to have to be across from the calf. One yeah. by the blue. And there's going to have to be one over here. STEM lab over there. Yeah. You can't go through the, well, it could be over here. I think they were saying, yeah, keeping them away from the classrooms. I think they said move the toilets to the right and put me put a door there. Yeah. So that came up last night as a topic. Alva yeah. wanted to flip-flop the stage to the other side of the gym so that the cafeteria could become like the backstage for the kids who were about to go on. Mm -hmm. That's really smart. Well, I was going to ask that because we had been talking about a cafeteria, gymatorium, or whatever the heck it is. How do you... <sighs> Correct. I don't remember what it involved. is. I don't remember. Cafetorium. Cafetorium. So how do, you, how do you merge all of that space if you've got a hallway going through? You that can't. That's you, why they would do like pull, pull, pull open doors. Thing. Like oh, Memorial okay. is now. Okay. Accordion. Yeah. You just open up those big doors and you use the hallway. And yeah. Okay. You so know what else they? In a lot space. of the design, what are those garage doors? They mm -hmm. use garage doors now for. Yeah. You, it's surprising. Up. That's pretty cool. Yeah. But how do you do that with a two-story space? You've got the light well and all that. That's their problem. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, that's interesting do. because then you're going to pick up if you when you do merge those spaces on an as-needed basis, you're going to pick up that square footage from the hallway. Mm -hmm. Very nice. The yes. just go up. And the garage doors typically are just on the first floor only and they can go right up into the ceiling. They can go up like a screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, so roll up doors. Fancy. Yes. Yes. Let's do another night of debating. Um, yes. okay. Okay. Anything else on this one? Wall of glass, too. You could do a wall mm -hmm. of glass and have big doors that just open. 
And is this the one where they say you look down on the gym? So it could be like seating, viewing yeah. from mm -hmm. the second floor down into the gym. It'd be like a gladiator pit. <laughs> That's okay. great. Next that's one. great. Yeah. Spoken like an education. Maybe that's our athletics. I think that's the that's feeling. Our I, elementary honest, that's the feeling I have with the in the center. It's it's just, like it, it, it seems very confined, very like a holding tank in the middle. So. Mm -hmm. But you're never. I think she so did a that's nice great job. If there's a tornado. Huh. I guess like it could be a good safe room. room. I don't know. So I think. I, I feel like if you think about right. it as your community gathering space, then it changes how it feels, and it starts to feel like nice and warm in the center of your community. If that's where you have assemblies and and holiday concerts and plays, like you gather in the center, like that feels nice. Okay. To me, it will can feel you, dark. Can you go back to the? Didn't she the say she was lighting it from the top? Yeah. yeah. Can you go back to the um, the so side, the, side plan? Is the idea just to have a practice field and no kind of monkey bar structure? Oh no no, this is like I think in addition to in addition. See those other so green wop. You know, the I didn't green. hear any mention of that. So is is eight? Is that no? That's not a number. That little yeah, kind eight. Of, that's an outdoor play. Outdoor so that's a area. play. That's a playground. Yeah. Kind this of is area. all still very high level. Right. This is no, not I know. We're situated. just compartmentalizing. Um, you yeah. also have some okay. space there above that practice field. You see it's to the right of it. Yeah. Like northeast of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. The, These uh, are again how they can fit on the property. On right. The site. That's, that's good. Like this is not important space for. This is yeah. not. Yeah. And the blue line is the, is the real bound the effective boundary when you consider wetlands. Okay. Okay. Alright, wanna go to the hub? Go to the hub. So the piano was a rebuild. These yeah. are all new. This is a new. Yeah, okay. And the uh, first new. initial. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it tells you new. So there Thank is you. the building. I didn't have this, I can see. Yeah, the end is. Okay. Yeah, next one. So mm -hmm. this is sixteen again. Modulars. Taking off those two wings. I don't think that they updated this, but yes, right now, because Whoa. didn't you, do we end yeah. up with six? Don't let that be disconcerting. Well, look at the poster. Isn't the poster updated? Maybe we should. Wow. No, that, because the piano is different in this, so it should be updated. Oh, yeah, the piano different. was the new piano. Yeah, so this should be the right one. So, These are different. so this is yeah. all a new <laughs> shape. And well, this is right. So this is right up here. Yep. Okay. okay. I don't think she changed the phasing yeah. diagrams. So this was more like this. I think the last time we saw it was it was like a V. A little, a little bit yeah. more V. A little bit more piano like. Like this. That, see, she didn't. What she did was didn't oh, change the phasing. Here. So this was the old phasing. Oh, okay. So that was the shape of the mm -hmm. old building. Yeah. And this was the gym back here, and this was the the gathering area. The hub. The hub. And it was huge, the hub. But she changed it to this. She just didn't, yeah. they didn't change out the slides or I have an yeah. older version. So she, she pulled back the gym to be behind the building. And this was the result of the conversations they had with the design group, which really I think, every, at the end of the meeting, everyone was like, I'm really looking at this one again. Like mm -hmm. I'm, I'm liking this. And one of the things that I thought was clever was Gordon was saying, it seems like you're giving a shoulder to the to Lincoln Street, and that's why they opened it up a little bit more, so that the uh, that viewing it from Lincoln Street was more welcoming, and um, they thought it was more curb appeal. Yeah, yeah, and that's because of the pre-K rooms. Yeah, at the, those four squares at the begin at the beginning to the right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's going to be like a, a lower set down building, mm -hmm. and then it's going to gradually build back up, so it doesn't look just like this huge monstrosity sitting right on. Mm. Right, so they were talking a lot about the scale, because this is going to be important when we go to the next one. The gym is, he said, the gym is three stories when you look at a gym. And he said, having the pre preschool be lower and how you could really do something interesting with it to kind of make it have, fit in the neighborhood, so that, that, that the gym wouldn't look so big. Mm -hmm. um, and they liked the approach of this. Um, you also see you have more green space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a smaller footprint. Mm -hmm. is, is this building or is that just outdoor solid pad? I think that's, that's a building. Can. We can. You want to go to the okay. floor plan? Yeah. yeah. That is um, the kitchen oh. in the uh, mechanical room. So the kitchen is here yeah. because this is the cafe here. And do you see how it's the adjacencies room. are really nice there? Yeah. And that's all community space. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. And the hub in the, the last week's or the two weeks ago version was really, really, really big. 
and he, it appears to be small here, but what did he say it was? It was like the size of four classrooms. Mm -hmm. so, so it is big. Yeah. Um, it can become bigger if we don't think it's big enough, but it looks small there, but it's this really is, this, so that's like the center area where everybody would be coming in and out. Yeah, and depending what we right. do in the pre-K, it's the easy to eliminate two rooms off the end. Yeah, can you show where the front door is? Right, right here? here? Yeah. And pre-K would have their own dismissal kind of Oh, like. so that's, oh, yes. Okay. Pre-K yeah. would have its own entrance if you wanted. As would the AP show the pre entrance. Like there's a, a vestibule, like in the other one, which I like for the safety purposes. Oh, you mean like a step? Yeah. I mean, and I think you could add that. Yeah. I think he said when we were at the hunky that every school has that now. So you would come in, there would be a blocked off space, and then you would okay. come in again. Huh. And you'd still have your security control access and the admin is right here looking out. So I think the way they'll set it up is to have a nice um, sight line yeah. for people who are coming in and out. That's nice. Um, and to Julie's point before, this would be a really nice gathering space because it's kind of in the center of a lot of learning. Mm -hmm. They noted that you come in and you're looking at learning. You don't come in mm -hmm. and look at the gym. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you do the calf with glass like they anticipate they're going to want to do, you nice. kids have sunlight in there. Nice view. fun and yeah. activity. Gordon also this liked would be the pre-K entrance over here, mm -hmm. and this could, would be the separate community entrance for the gym, and there's a small parking lot That's nice. right over here. Oh, Gordon cool. also liked the fact that when you came into the building that you could see out onto wetlands. Mm -hmm. um, and he thought that was a nice... So the design team, I think, did some really nice work with mm -hmm. Lauren, but Lauren did great with responding to all the different feedback. So and then the second floor, if you want to talk about that a little sure, bit. Sure, this is the media center here above the admin. Um, I think she's talking about doing uh, an outdoor green garden oh, nice. above oh. the pre-K. This right here, we're, uh, she's calling it a porch, but it could be a porch <laughs> or a balcony or outdoor space, so there's ability, you could, you could open classrooms onto it or it could just be a nice light line, a nice uh, view out. Um, this is a bridge connecting to the media center from the STEM lab. So again, some more glass and an overlook down into the community area. Um, cool. And this is just the, the top of the gym. So, so can, can I the gym? So I think the other thing she's doing that's a nice- swing pool though, so yeah, I don't have to have. So that shows you how the, the, second, the first floor floors. extends <laughs> up level. Yeah. So you're not looking down on that, but that's level with the second floor, right. but there's no entrance way in there. It's a wall. You could, I think they talked about you could put some glass and be, have an overlook. Stadium seating. One, one thing about the, the Kerr Memorial School, and this is, I'm just oh, realizing okay. looking at it, just about every classroom has some sort of, they, they not only have windows looking outside, but they also have immediate direct access outside. And that, I imagine, doesn't get used. I honestly, I'm, I'm just thinking with all this, there isn't, there aren't like the large concrete or paved areas outside. And I don't think they're used that much. It's just an observation that yeah. the the in and out through these is through seems to be mostly through smaller controlled entrances. Each room doesn't have its own door, yeah. and I, I assume that's just been a shift in how schools are built. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be a nightmare, imagine, for security. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a pro and a con. You can get out fast. We can do record evacuation. Yeah, at the uh, memorial school, but it's also an entry another entry point that. It's monitoring and being outside access, yeah. All that. It's also if you're the teacher and you have to set up your classroom, it's like one more, you know, like mm -hmm. when you're putting your furniture lost in the space. house, it's yeah. one more, yeah. yeah. Lost space, lost wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think to Ken's point, I mean, we j we're joking about kind of how different feelings about the gym in the center of the building. I think the conversation that started around that was it would be a stark difference from a building that's very that's everything's rambling outside. and everything's outside and you mm -hmm. feel like it's the outside is part of you to be in something that feels much more like a confined yeah. institutional space um, not that you couldn't make it warm and I think people really like this because it, this is the one design that I heard people say kind of welcomes you into the building you know yeah. think about it like a welcome open arms into a nice big glass open space that can be used for community yeah. gatherings I imagine I know just with the logistics of people coming and going, dismissal can also be out the far in the hallway, like the same as is on the left. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just assembly areas for fire drills and things like that outside. And I think if you look at the board in the in this version of the plan, there was there's only six modulars that would be needed. Correct. Six in yellow. Six in yellow. Oh, wow. So okay. you know, just to talk out loud, uh, think out loud a little bit. In talking to Lauren at the close of the meeting last night. If you think 
that you will only need that for a year, and you take art and music and have them push in for a year and not have a dedicated room, then you're really left with four, needing to find four spaces. Yeah. So if you bundled the pre-K and K, I think we could take a real hard look at Essex to mm -hmm. see if there's, mm -hmm. it would mean doing things differently for a year, but some office spaces that are now in old classrooms that could be claimed, that we might be able to do it without any modulars. Oh, or maybe really a modular yeah. attached to the back of Essex to create office space for displaced personnel. But yeah. I, I think this one gives us the, the best mm -hmm. chance to really cut costs yep. on housing kids. That'd be great. Don't you think that as an overarching thing that when the cost um, estimations come in for each of these remaining designs, that's really going to drive decisions a lot? Wouldn't you think that? Because all the designs are great and have pros and cons. And Don't you think if they're big, um, they're I, don't, yeah. I, I think, think they're going to be big spreads. Th that's what yes. we talked about last yeah. night at the end of the meeting. Hearing on our designer's side. Charlie, Charlie said they're, gonna be, they're gonna be about the same. Oh, okay. He said, so if you're going to look at a 50 year building, and you're going to, he said, nor, you know, a taxpayer is going to think, uh, my taxes are going up. I want to make sure that I have a 50 year mm -hmm. building that is what we need. It's going to last. It's going to be something we can add on to. Good, efficient building. You know, if it's, you know, a matter of two million either way, um, you probably would pick yeah. the best building. And I think, to be honest with you, for the best for the program. Yeah. Um, he said they are all, when we, when we looked at even mm -hmm. um, Mike's numbers, they were pretty much the same. So I think it'll be interesting to see what the numbers are, but yeah. interesting. Um, don't forget too, you're gonna part of it being a fifty year building, you're gonna pay for it over twenty five to thirty year bonds. So you take that couple million dollar difference, you amortize that over thirty years, and then you spread that over mm -hmm. two town populations, it it has a potential to be ex extremely negligible difference. Yeah. So mm -hmm. can you add on to this if need be, Jeff? All of them you can. And MSBA requires that yeah, you have that option. Well, this right here again, if we go with just two pre-K and not the four, right away you have a spot to extend if you get run yeah. into, yeah. into trouble. You go um, off of that where your arrow is to the right? You yeah, you, if we don't, if we only do two pre-K classrooms, these two, this one and this one will come off. She said she might expand that a little bit, but then it, if you need to build later, you could put one, two, maybe even a third or fourth classroom there. Mm -hmm. But I do think there's a lot of, they, we are building in as much flex space as possible. And I don't know if Andy mentioned it on this one, but um, another big plus on this was impact on traffic flow. This has a lot of increased queuing because people will come in here and tee up around the circle for drop off and then have to go out. So you're gonna move a significant number of cars off of Lincoln, which has a positive impact on the neighborhood. So this she, one has a lot of things to like about it. And it's flexible. I think she said you could also go to three stories on that side if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanted to make it even more compact. Yeah. Um, so Which I, might get you more playing field. Yeah. So th this was a really good kind of result from the conversations we had had. It was, people left that meeting feeling really good about this one. Mm -hmm. I, I have a quick question. How far mm -hmm. are we from elevation? Are you just rough ideas? I don't know. Because, you know, it's one thing to sort of say, like, this one really works and we love it. And then when we start seeing, like you mentioned, how the it starts kind of small from the entrance and then it, you know, the gym's in the back and it kind of, I mean. Oh, schematic design? I think Elevation, that, like from looking how, at it from yes, we don't ground know. level. Yeah. yeah. I know we're a ways away, of, like, yeah. quite far from that. Yeah. But I'm just I would curious. say in the next four months, though, mm -hmm. you're going to yep, see schematics. Right. Yeah. Okay. But the goal is to have that kind of nailed down by the, uh, by the last last couple months of the school year. Okay. If you, you just mentioned possibly adding a third story, where do you do that? On the larger piece on yeah. the left? Yeah. Okay. I think some would come off the end and go up on the top. Mm -hmm. So we have to pick a building without seeing the elevation? No. Nope. We pick a scheme. Uh, oh. Pick one of these schemes. Well, that's what my scheme. concern is. If we pick I thought they said they were going to show us elevations. I don't remember. I think you want to see at least three. No? Uh, no, I don't believe that we're going to be seeing the elevations to be picking a building. Really? Be yeah, because there's a, see, a, 
just goes back to the idea of what this is versus isn't, and it's a great question. It may right. not satisfy your question, mm -hmm. right. but what the, the way the process works is they're really trying to understand fit and placement rather than design. Some, so, and you have to pick a preferred fit and placement before you get into the design. So the problem with that, to your point, yes, there are some things you won't be able to know by then, and, and I would say elevation, from what I understand, and that is one of them, unless. Mm -hmm. I don't think we get I, I don't, at yeah. Because at this point, they're talking about a configuration plan, and then from that configuration plan, then they would start to look into those issues. So, you, so unfortunately, I don't think we would have that type of information typically this case. Okay. okay. So the one that oh. is left, yeah, the last thing I was going to say is, although I think when you look at M M9, I think it will kind of answer some of those questions because one of the things that comes up is you can't see the elevation, but how some of the taller components fit into mm -hmm. the picture. Yeah. So. so there you go. Look at all those modulars. Wait, so now we're moving on to the hook? That's yep. the, this, this, is the hook. hook. this is the hook as it gets built. And Final when the order. hook okay. originally came up, it was a last minute add because she thought she could do it without any modulars. Okay, and and then looking at the wetlands, mm. um, it changed the story. So, and it pulled, go ahead. no. So there's the the modulars, and I don't, I can't count that, but it looks like eighteen maybe. Yeah, I, mean, uh, I think no. she also said that this 20. one we will end up without the gym for a bit of time. Yeah. yeah. Not that it's about the gym. So again, orange is tear down and blue is yeah. Mm -hmm. blue light is blue. New. Light blue is new. Light blue is new. Dark That's blue is retained. Retained. So you'd have to build, yeah. For that phase only. So this will be coming out. Then you have no gym for a bit, and then you build a gym. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of modulars. That. That's a four, how many phases is this one? Four phases. And then, but this is it in the end. So one of the things that, um, so we were looking at this. And so let's talk about some of the design things that came up. You're approaching and you see this big gym, right? Yeah. So Charlie said, you know, that's big. Like you're driving up and that's what you see. Um, and Gordon did not like, was really pointed, and a couple of people actually. Do you see the space between 3, 4, and then the other way? There's that big. Right in here. They kind of felt like that's a bit of an alley, like an alley or a very confined. You're talking about those kind of peach colored? Areas? Yeah, like, yeah, that peach, that peach yeah. walkway. The walkway between. Um, Three, four, and the yeah. yellow boxes. That yeah. you're kind of going into a darker space that is not open. But no, yeah. And um, they weren't really warm and fuzzy about that. So, what else did but they But Warren was saying that this, it, right here? this that, that could be an entrance just for the students. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, the students can kind of all congregate in that general area and play and have a drop off, and then the students, so that can be student entry only. Right? Is this that one? Yeah. And then the yeah. main entrance is right here. Right. Yeah. Oh. More, so again, yeah. it kind of had that institutional, less welcoming feel because you're coming right into admin and the gym, and a very long hallway. Mm -hmm. So that's the elevation thing, because you'll see a two-story block yeah. right up front. Yeah. Are you gaining anything with a bigger practice field there, or no? No. Should we no. even look at? Yeah. I think same it's size. the same size. Same size as the other. Smaller. I don't know if that's. Yeah. Okay. And it doesn't have the extra parking lot. Right. It doesn't. And it doesn't do as much for queuing mm -hmm. as the other one did, but it does a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I think if Yeah, because you you're missing that whole swoop that you have yep. before. It has so many more mod modulars, it's mm -hmm. hard to believe it will come in at the same price as the ones that have so many fewer modulars. Well, the reimbursable think, portion will be a lot yeah. worse. Other, other things was yeah. like, administration yeah. is over here in no man's, not, it's not no man's land, but it's <laughs> it's across from the gym. It's not at all close to the classroom. Not really connected. No, I hadn't and even then, thought of that. The, hmm? I hadn't thought of Me that. Me neither. Um, What's to the left of administration? I can't read that. Media. 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 So I guess it's near. It's near, kind of the heart of the. It's near the media center, the library, the com, the the commons. But so like school nurse would be kind mm -hmm. of in that, dark yep, admin that's, corridor area. Yeah, that's what okay. that says right here is admin nurse. Okay. So. There are pros and cons to it because you need that there to be kind of part of the security check coming in, but it feels not integrated into the educational space. Mm -hmm. And actually, media doesn't either. It, it feels more segregated. Mm -hmm. And I think people talked about that here too. Like, you've got this whole wing that's out here on its own. And it's funny because it's not, it's a little, to some eye, you would call it crooked because it looks like a hockey stick. And that really bothered a couple of people. 
me. It's like, I know you're not going to be looking at an area, but like John was like, the left brainers. You want everything nice and tidy and square. Um, but I really like the way she added this, and I thought that gave it some warmth. Mm -hmm. So I guess we have different opinions about, because mm -hmm. um, in, the, in the first one, there was nothing there. It was just like a gap between the two buildings. So that kind of made it feel like it had a purpose. Is it asphalt? Uh, it, it would be a walkway. walkway. And you can come Benches. out of the media center. So you can kind of envision it where if you could, seeing students in there and have it be a place where people were using it instead of kind of just a no man's land in between. You know, yeah, I think in early on people talked about courtyards that don't get used, that are kind of landlocked and hard to maintain, whereas this is an open potential courtyard that could be an accessible all spot. The, all the designs on this, whether they're, they're all two story. So you're inherently going to have upper grades upstairs or mm -hmm. <coughs> some sort of staircase at each end of the hall and elevator. And this one has a green roof and another porch if you go <coughs> up to the second level. And something that she was calling, you, the fifth grade would be a little bit out on its own. You could make it like a fifth grade academy and make them feel special about it. You've got the porch and some outdoor space. Um, but I think it's just a function of you've got to have three classrooms over there. so. The older kids are going to go over there, and you can you can make it work to your advantage. That's kind where, of cool. where would the staircases be on this one? On either end of the long. Yep, this is right here are the stairs. Okay. In the elevator. So you always got to march through the front administration gym to get to your stairs. Yeah. Which, Which way is north? Straight, is up. Like straight up. Just straight up. Yeah. Okay. This is the one that had the lower floor. Uh, so oh right. Oh yeah. Stairs. This so, one has the so mechanicals below. below. Oh. Using the same grade that we have today, where that, there's that kind of roadway that mm -hmm. goes down towards what's currently used by the, uh, mm -hmm. the parks and rec yeah. area. So that would be a place we talked a little bit about where you could add some additional space. Yeah. Because you don't have the, uh, the park parking at the north side there and that yeah. big queuing area, mm -hmm. you wouldn't need to do as much leveling there, and so you could have a lower floor in this option. Just yeah. another way to use space effectively. Do you guys worry up. about the wet in the lower floors, like water in the basement? It's not the low grade. It's just it's lower. It's actually still above the, the brook yeah. quite a bit. So. Yeah, uh, but if you have a flooding situation, all bets are off. Yeah. You, you could, but it, even that area today is it's up from the turf field. Do you think yeah. from the turf field up yeah. to the bottom part where Parks and Rec is, it's, there's a decent elevation here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that's what we talked about. That's awesome. Um, Thank you. Um, James. And that's what they're going to talk about on the 31st, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> it's good for folks to be there to hear what people in the public are talking about. So that would be great. If you got to make sure they really do say okay. this is still high level. Okay. Onward. This is just how it fits on um, the Finance <laughs> committee. We don't have anything, do we? Not, but we have a meeting next Tuesday. That we've been trying desperately to reschedule here, there, and everywhere, and we finally, thanks to Pam, inked it. So we go. So I didn't do a good job because I'll just point out that we're missing most of the S, most of the Manchester contingent. Oh, really? That morning, the but in that is we will be with them tomorrow night for an True. extended mm -hmm. period of time. So I'm, I'm okay with that. I thought it was for 45 minutes. Yeah. You said 45 minutes. Okay. 45 minutes. okay. Tomorrow's 45 minutes, and what's Tuesday? <laughs> Tuesday is our uh, oh, collaboration room. Oh, cool. Okay, great. Oh. And that's um, the Good morning. Okay, communications okay. subcommittee, communications policy. Um, what did we talk about for communication? I don't remember. Sorry. Oh, we got the article. The article is going in. I'll send it to everybody. Um, I'll put it in the blog, we'll go in the weekly, it's into the cricket after three revisions, and wait, don't print this one, because I didn't see Ken's comments until after I had sent it to her. That's fine. But we got them in, we got them in. Um, we, and what is the article? The article's title is Rising Healthcare Costs, The Persistent Problem. Mm -hmm. um, so we just yeah. blended everybody's everything. Mm -hmm. um, and it just basically states that we are having significant budget difficulties, one and a half million dollars over two years with a 28 and 60 percent back-to-back increase to healthcare, um, that we are hard at it trying to close the gap. 
that in this case, enrollment, rising enrollment or shifting enrollment is working for us uh, in that we're able to make some reductions at the elementary to shift resources to the high school. Also noting that it's a demographic shift, that we just have less children available to enter school, which is what's causing the smaller classes. Um, and kind of an overview of what we've done historically around health care to try and manage it. And some very broad categories of what we're looking at to close the gap. So it's just a... And then some meeting announcements yeah. as well. So, yeah. so the budget, good. so that also is serving as our, in addition to the community meeting next week, it's our second budget hearing. Mm -hmm. So that's on Tuesday night, and that this will serve as a notice for that, too. Thank you, guys. Excellent. I was at the selectmen's meeting last night. And oh, I did a thank plug you for the meetings too. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. So, yeah. Did in they Essex. have any questions, or are they? No. Brendan just wants to make sure that you know everything comes to them and before we make decisions and so forth. So, mm -hmm. yeah. No, it was good. Okay. Good. I, think, I think one important thing about the article, just worth noting, is there was discussion about talking about the future and all the rest, and we kind of kept it to this date, this time, mm -hmm. this right. issue. Right. Which I think is in keeping with the theme. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. We reconcile the past. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a song. We're working on it. I'll break, I'll break okay. the guitar. Fundraising policy. It's in here for your reference. Okay, it's so last um, week. Okay, I have not read it. Okay. Um, do we want to take a minute to read it? This is the existing policy, or yeah. is this changed? This is the existing policy. Oh, okay. So I'm assuming we're going to look at this. Um, and then throw it back at um, policy subcommittee to kind of talk about what they might possibly want to do with it. I didn't have, I mean, if that's your intention, that's great. I didn't intend it for anything else other than it became a topic of conversation last week with the athletics group. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was a good point of reference for us to have it because, but if you feel like it needs to be tuning, tuned up, just send it right well, back to policy. This is interesting because it doesn't say, because the, the policy for athletics, what the parents were saying was that there was no fundraising allowed for individual teams, but that's not yeah, the number four. Number four. Mm -hmm. um. <laughs> so just, just out of curiosity, if this has been the policy and the standing policy for a while, I'm just going to throw it out there. Why did two teams come to us and ask to fundraise? I mean, we, we've, we've dealt with it, but... They're buckets of fundraising. So fundraising for individual teams would be a parent group wanting to do fundraising for lacrosse. Right. The original intent behind the trip to Cooperstown and the trip to New Jersey mm -hmm. for the girls was to be funded by um, an outside organization. So I think there's a different, there's a, a little bit of a gray area between fundraising and donations. And I think the conversation started got difficult because there may have been funding available for one sport more so than there was funding available. For, there was more willingness to contribute more for one sport than the other. Or an outside organization From an that outside had already organization. committed? Or was in the process was of willing, evaluating a commitment? Willing <coughs> to give one of the groups money to go on a trip. Got it. And it had to be brought to their attention, no fault of anyone's that we're under Donations of that nature, regardless of how the money was raised outside, should go through the principal, and I think this was the spirit behind this, because any outside organization that donates to an athletic team has to do so equally. Mm -hmm. The funds have to be distributed equally. It's a Title IX um, compliance issue. So if the girls softball youth league wants to raise and give funds to the girls team to buy new shirts or new uniforms that's great but the, the district's going to have um, a responsibility to ensure that one team isn't being better funded than the other because of this outside organization so it's about keeping equity and balance particularly among male and female sports as well because there is a tendency to have more organizations out there for the male sports so that's where some of the controversy comes in and some of the complication comes in. Because people are good natured and they're really just trying to help. And as we're learning more and more, we are in a very compliance driven environment. So one 
One person's good deed is seen as a slight by another person or organization. So that's where the complications come in and why it's probably going to feel uncomfortable for some of these organizations as we're trying to hold them to this. Do you guys feel comfortable if I bring all of you and then for you and Ken to look at, again, um, questions, concerns, or recommendations from the Athletic Task Force? Of course. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely. That's there. Okay. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. So we should probably hold off until you've had a chance to do that. Um. Do you remember, uh, could I give a little history behind how we got to this policy too? Mm -hmm. Do you recall? It became an issue because some organizations were also cornering the market mm -hmm. and doing so much that it was leaving very little available for others to do. People so were abiding by the rules and then there were other folks who, who were, were not abiding by the yes. rules. So this was never mm -hmm. intended to be for athletics. It was intended to be for all groups that wanted to fundraise so that there would be some order. Raffles was an issue at the time. People were, there's a whole litany of rules and regulations around raffles. And we were having raffles that nobody knew about. So where does the cash go? Where the, you know, so. It's different names for those, aren't It's one of those things that it sounds very picky -yune, and it sounds like we're throwing roadblocks and being difficult. And I think our desire would want to be to be as, you know, go with the flow as possible. But when there's a problem, we're going to hold the liability for the problem. So kind of an ounce of prevention, I think, was behind this. And not to target athletics over any other group. That's all. Uh, I think, I guess, one thing that I would ask is, I know I realize it's athletics targeted, but having non-athletic kids and seeing some of the other programs like that was a great feedback on DECA, robotics, mm -hmm. um, just all the school activities would be kind of good to be clear about what's athletics and what's athletics and other extracurriculars, fundraising, yeah, just to, yeah. It should all be that. in part That's of this. In here, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I mean okay. even people need, who on that task force need to understand it's not just about athletics, it's about all extracurriculars. Right? And, and if there is a task force, it may be interesting. It would be useful, I think, with any any organization that's, again, DEC or whatever, to just make sure there's something official that goes out to say, hey, we're doing, we're touching all of this. This would affect you, or this affects you somehow. And just to, so people, just hearing some of the robotics parents that, oh, there's a new policy. We want to be compliant. Where is this? What does this come out? How does this mean? Yeah. And, well, there's so much gray area, like Rachel. I don't know about your experience with um, girls sports, but do you ever have your daughters um, have, like the whole team buys the same swag? Do you ever have your daughters when they meet, like let's say uh, win their division, everyone chips in and gets a win, won the division t-shirt? Like there's a lot of gray area in what teams do, and I don't think there are mm -hmm. unfair things happening, but right. it's not but, on paper. But those yeah. are usually paid for. I mean, when we bought it, was I paid for it? My parents. Yeah, right. I know because I was involved right. earlier in with your property. Like, yeah. right. I think sometimes, sometimes it happens that one parent gets excited, buys all these T-shirts, says, you know, ten dollar donation yeah, if you want, and not everyone gets right. around to it. Yeah. Right. Well, I was involved this fall in a couple of, you know falls before with um, team gear and setting up team gear to buy, like a website so that you could just go on and buy and whatever. And I know, um, I think proceeds from that went to the school. I think it was like 5% or something like that went to the school. And the mom who ran it was like, who do I give the check to? I can't give it to the team. I'm like, no, you cannot give it to the team. So I think it went to the PTO. But it's, you know, kind of that, that's, that's the equity piece of it. Um, but yeah, there was a lot of like, oh God, I have to buy My kids have also shirt. gotten journalism shirts, yeah. debate shirts. Oh, yeah. You know, it might be nice. good to think about having a uh, district shop, however, that would get I set up, that. where everything goes through one district yep. shop. So if you, want, the same. if you want so drama shirts, or journalism that. shirts, or DECA shirts, right. or yes. baseball shirts, or something special, or you want like your Vineyard Vines, Manchester Essex Hornet tie, or hat, or whatever, it all goes through the shop, and then Please, no. That's how we collect our royalties <laughs> for Vineyard Avi. Vines. 
Sorry. I'm just saying, I mean, I think a lot of private schools do that, but mm -hmm. that's like, it's a money maker and mm -hmm. it kind of gets rid of all of the mm -hmm. Well, honestly, that's what we were trying things. to do in trialing this particular company that we were using for a couple of things. Yeah. <laughs> so to, uh, to, my to, to show it to Paul things. and say, all right, can you yeah. pick this up for athletics and maybe like, you know, widen it out so all the teams can order from this uh -huh. and all the teams can look the same and it can yeah. all run with yeah, I think it needs to be it, like it does need to have somebody to run it, and I think usually it needs to be some kind of parent volunteer position. Yeah, she did. All okay. I want to say to you is I think we would be foolish not to revisit this policy with how we are money just financially mm -hmm. overall, mm -hmm. and I believe in equity and everything, but there's got to be some kind of middle ground if it's just one overarching boosters. I don't even know what the hell the heck all those people are. And then it all goes equally, but I really do think it would be very foolish of us not to. But the boosters, this is the boosters limiting. are very careful about spreading the money around to all the teams. Okay. They have I to be. I don't know, but yeah. they shouldn't be. See, the, the concept behind the fundraising is the fundraising is given to the athletics program, right? And if you look at your, your I should have brought you the. Um, I guess it's a companion policy, a school donation. A what policy? Donations policy? Companion policy? Companion policy. So the donations this. policy kind of works alongside this. So the boosters aren't fundraising. The boosters are making donations. And if they're making a donation to the school, I forgot what the cutoff is, but if it's a low financial amount, it goes to the principal and it goes to the program. So you're either going to support, you can say you want to support the football program, but then it needs to kind of go through the process of the district ensuring that the donations that are coming in for the football program are offset by other funds that are going to other programs. Well, the boosters buy all the trophies for all the teams at yeah. the end of the season. That's what their and funds primarily go to. I used the wrong one. word. I just only want I know that there is. I don't know what the other yeah, is. Yeah, but that's the same. I guess the idea yeah. of that. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we'll get this. Uh, yes, policy. Can I say one more thing? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And is there nothing to be said for like teaching kids how to? Fundraise. fundraise and raise money for their uh, something that they're interested in and kind of uh, to me that's like a teaching experience as well so I don't know I think that the, the I, fear I was door-to-door door. Door. like that was that's the spe specific direction well, here which is the door-to-door right door. but, it can be but you, well and then they have their whole Thanks. senior you know they have to you can be sitting in front of the post class, office so but you have to have good. parent, you have to have parent yeah. supervision I mean, yeah Kids do I think there's a lot here. of so there's a lot of great areas yeah. yeah. that used to fundraise a lot. I remember they, when the ball was falling. And debate. Oh my God! And the fifth graders fundraised for Mero Vista in Essex. There is a lot of fundraising. There was a time when we were yeah. using class time to put together fundraising campaigns. So we were paying teachers to be teaching classes, and the class was putting together mailers and fundraising materials and I, I think yes. we're having a short memory on this because mm -hmm. this came out of the feeling like there was too much fundraising mm -hmm. kids right. were being asked to do too many things simultaneously and that people were getting well, here's the other problem, problem. Exactly. there was an expectation yeah. of a certain level of sales so you would you would come your kid would come home with a pile of cards and say I need to sell all 20 of these and the reality was that we had just come off of a PTO, a PTO auction. It was overwhelming. Yeah. So you ended um, up putting the bill. I do. I do not forget those times. And, um, and I'll so also add this very is real. generally that we've also had to expend legal funds to clean up fundraising issues. So this is. I know right now it feels like we're saying, you know, no sports shirts, and that's not what this is. No. That, that there's nothing in here that prevents kids from getting shirts, parents from buying um, swag for the kids, or from organizations contributing to the overall athletics program. What there is are guidelines around the principal needs to know when these things are happening. The principal needs to know when somebody's making a donation. You don't go to the person who is not empowered to say yes or no, or may not feel comfortable saying yes or no. So it's getting the adults to take their good deeds and just keep them organized so everybody's getting what they need and no one group is getting more than another and the pr people who need to be aware of it and are going to be held responsible is everything actually so we the, the athletic director really needs to have a huge role the principal in this all fundraising also, goes yeah, to like the all principal the but she, okay that's all i, I mean that's how we that. set it up okay great so so uh, any so if the ad wants to do a fundraiser mm -hmm. 
he has to get it approved by the by principal. principal. Yeah. Yep. If DECA cap, DECA advisor wants to do a fundraiser, he's got to get approved by right. the principal. I was and there's a sports certain wise, protocol that should, process they have to follow. Should, should so be. it is not like everything has to be above be like board, and, and the, they have all that. Have all there's that. everything okay, is. Bring it up. We're good. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so onward to negotiations. We're having a we're having a training at the end of the week on the twenty sixth. Yes, correct? We are on Friday. Excellent. All right. All right. Onward with that. Superintendent's report, Pam. I have a, a couple of quick positive things, and then we'll probably go into. Well, did you want to talk athletics philosophy philosophy before that? Uh, you tell me. Um, Yes. Yes, you do. Okay, great. So Sorry. let's talk because about athletics philosophy. Yeah, thank you. Can you, <laughs> so here's here's my question. Are we giving Julie a sense of the direction we're headed in, or are we saying we want this, this, and this? I'm hoping we're saying here's the general direction that we would like to. What I'm tasked with. Yes. Mm -hmm. is, that, is, that, is that what you expected, Pam? I think what the hope is, and in conversations with Tricia, is that the athletics program needs to reflect the values of the community mm -hmm. and what Trisha's values are or my personal values are may not be consistent with that. Mm -hmm. So as representatives of the community, what's the school committee's, what does the school committee want out of the athletics program? What does it expect to do? Yep. It's expected to do and what is it willing how does it view things like cut policy versus everybody has a, has a place for everybody policy? So I'll start. So I don't know if there's any hard and fast rules. To can I just go from one before you start? Just throw something out there? Right, can I start? Sure. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> that wasn't a day. I just want to throw out there that, like, when we're talking about what our philosophy is, I mean, we want our middle school programming to be more well, you know, the, the whole child and, you know, you mm -hmm. can learn how to, this is where you can learn how to play lacrosse or this. It's not about you've gone through town league and you are now ready to play varsity. So is that a philosophy we want our middle school programming to, to have? Or do you want our middle school programming to be like really like a, the feeder program for our varsity? So is it more sports or is it more philosophical, educational, health driven? So those are, that's why I was okay. kind of thinking of the yep. things we that's need to do. So there's some, so, so here's a question. Can I answer the question? No, no, no. So here's, here's the I first know, question. Let me just get this done. Middle school and high school, we want a clean break. I think so. Yes. yes. Okay, so do we need to discuss that at all any further, or do we, or do we want to make well, that clear that we want to well, do it? Clarify by clean break. Well, I think we need to discuss it. For, that you want a middle school program, just as this woman mm -hmm. recommended, that More middle whole child, not I think, we should I think whole child applies to all athletics. Yeah, what? I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want it to just be. The more. recommendation of Nancy in her report was yeah. about making middle school. Separate intramural, they can use the gym when basketball isn't using it, so that's in the fall season and the spring season. Um, so things after school that include more kids, um, learn to play, you know, that kind of feeling. Not having seventh and eighth grade kids be eligible to play on high school teams. Okay, right now is like, so to clear to trying to say right now the middle school programs are seen as kind of almost a feeder yeah. follow on to the high school and the, and some of the point is to give the exception of equal weight teams. or hey it's it's yeah. important in both and maybe it's different yeah. for a younger it's a little bit I don't think it applies to all teams it does not. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're necessarily the I mean, we have pretty intense soccer teams in high school but there are no by and large middle school it's very much fun oriented middle school soccer it's but just sort of like free but to, to Carolyn's point huh? I think the Carolyn's point, there's a legacy of there are certain teams that do certain right. things we have certain expectations yep. for. And then man, if you want to go to intramural, you know, right. volleyball, that's cool. Right. And so do we want to have it across all Yeah, and I, mm -hmm. I have a bias not being a particularly sporting or athletic person to say, hey, you know what one thing I really enjoyed about college and like at that is that there's a range of athletic experiences available from let's go hiking mm -hmm. to or mountain biking too, okay, we're going to do intense football and basketball with every day, you know, training and all the rest. And somehow or another, I think we got to capture all that and give it equal weight is my, yeah. to your question. I, I like the idea that you had about sort of the learn to play and sort of take all the crazy competitiveness out of 
that middle school atmosphere because they're just kind of learning who they are. And yes, there are kids who are going to be great athletes and can play on varsity teams. Great, let them go do their like select team thing. But I think it's really nice to to address sort of that whole child, which we're trying to do across the board. But also we're also we're also trying to give the middle school their own identity, and, yeah. and you know not a junior high school. Well, it also opens it up to a variety of activities. Mm -hmm. So, Absolutely. as Ken said, if, if middle schoolers can be offered a lot of things after school, not just basketball, football, soccer, lacrosse, but also hiking, mountain biking club, and yeah. frisbee. Physical activity. Frisbee. Whatever. Physical activity. Yeah. yeah. Um, Dodgeball. I just, the way we structured the panel, I mean, Trisha structured the panel, is the panel of, is it, are we calling it a panel? Task, 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 task force. Is a task force? Um, seems to be very geared toward high school. Was it only sent toward high school parents? Mm -hmm. So the task force is already high school. Yes. So I think I feel like maybe we need a separate task force that's yeah. middle school. Or well, throw school. So many people who were chosen with younger children. She, wanted yeah. to, she thought that was for school committee to decide the uh -huh. middle school, we'll high school thing. So I think we need but a separate people, task force. I, I think some, some of the people, the idea was some of the people that were being chosen to be on the task force also have younger have children. Younger children. Uh -huh. Some of them also don't even have children in the school anymore, are community members uh -huh. who, you know, okay. were involved. So I don't think it's... Um, no, she tried to balance it out, but well, I think it does. Right. But it's it is basically focused structuring high school. <coughs> action <coughs> items for high school yeah. athletics. And middle school. And middle school. <coughs> yeah. So let me, I don't want to be in the com I want to yeah. listen, yeah. but I want to offer just a couple of points mm -hmm. of clarification. So history of the middle school athletics program. There is no middle school no. athletics program. It's an arm of the high school from when we were a much smaller school and you needed the numbers to create a team. Mm -hmm. So it was a function it was a function of pragmatics to have enough kids to field a varsity team in some areas to include kids from the middle school. So what's happened over time is that as our population's gotten bigger, the teams have gotten bigger and in some areas the middle school students don't have that same purpose. So they've either been, not always um, tactfully, but it's told that there is no room, mm -hmm. or carried on kind of a freshman unit, which just kind of gets big and difficult to manage. So bigger sports like soccer kind of split off and we ran a, mi a separate middle school division. So I think something to think about is right now we're at our height of enrollment, but we know that K1, 2, and 3 are down to two sections at Memorial and two sections at Essex, which averages 80 students. I'm not stating a position, but if we eliminate, if we section off middle school, if we take middle Will school out of the equation for high school, what's the impact going to be if we start carrying classes of 80 students? I feel like there so could it be. Just, it's just something to yeah. think about. And then cost of middle school mm, activities. Yes, I was just mm -hmm. going to ask that. So the students will be pulled out with the promise that we're going to create a robust after school intramural program for them. How do we pay for it? With what, wampum beads? Yeah, I mean, I think the MAC has an interest. I know they've, they've been looking to partner with us, and maybe it becomes you know, the Parks and Rec or the Y. We're developing a really strong relationship with the Y. So I think there are ways to do it. Well, and Essex um, has a relationship with the Y already for yeah, after school that's activities. really strengthening, yeah. too. Yeah. That's, that's really... And the third thing is the constituents. Mm -hmm. I know the conversation we're having here, what are we going to... Uh, what are the expectations of all of the youth sports teams in town who I think are represented on the athletics by a few people who want to see more developmental athletics programs along the way to feed the high school programs. So if you just pull out the middle school years. No, that already happens in town. Kids um, are always doing both. Who, who, who do we need to answer to on shutting down that avenue for certain kids? I can think of impact of when we eliminated middle school golf. There's a large, large concern there. Kids were not getting in the pipeline fast enough. Um, so I think there is a contingent out there who doesn't see it this way. Mm -hmm. Well, there could be a middle school golf program. It just wouldn't be attached to the high school golf team. But it wouldn't be competitive. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so I think there's people that feel that, that it's it the interscholastic component that makes right. them competitive. But the reality develop. is the competition is really uh, MIAA. Mm -hmm. And Nancy said there wasn't a lot of competition. There weren't a lot of schools that had middle school competitive teams. Right. So, so MIAA is high school. Well, that's the thing with soccer. That's why soccer, middle school soccer was co-ed. There weren't enough girl, girls here and then girl teams. There weren't any. 
yeah. so they had to just throw them all together. Well, and a lot of kid, girls didn't want to do that. The kids are too young to play on MIAA teams unless we get waivers. So I think mm -hmm. that pretty much the waivers that. The waivers for the numbers. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So a couple things. To make a team. Mm -hmm. so, so things have changed in our district over time. Things like You're not convinced debate. Me. No, You're discussing them. Yeah. <laughs> Things like debate used to be very, very popular and has changed based on who's here to support the program or to lead the program. So I think that what I'd like for you to take to the task force is that there is an interest in separating middle and high school. Perhaps explore that. But also that you may not be able to field a team and then that may be, that may be mm -hmm. some teams no longer survive and that maybe those other teams that we've had a lot of interest in rise. So I'm not afraid of change. I, that's how I feel. Yeah. And I feel like that's going to lead into the other discussion about cut or no cut because yeah. I feel like every year a certain number of students are interested in each team and every year and this is what we've talked about for years on school committee when teams are too big or too small and is that needs to be looked at, and then decisions have to get made. There are too many kids trying out for X, so we're going to have not only varsity, but um, JV and freshmen. Mm -hmm. There are not enough kids trying out for X, so we are going to cut the JV team and only have varsity, and we're going to have cuts. Like, there are decisions that have to get made for mm -hmm. quality of the program, mm -hmm. experience of the student, uh, expense to the district that are I think means that every sport, every season needs to be looked at as a fluid thing that we have decisions to make about cut or no cut, number of teams, number of coaches, all of those things. We don't just like have JV and varsity X and that is um, concrete. And I think you'll learn more as you talk to Patricia about her experience with other schools and how this is ebbed and flowed and maybe how they wanted to keep some because they saw interest in the middle school coming up and yeah so it's not going to be a year to year I think it'll be more of a rolling kind of thing wouldn't you see that happening is that you have well it does vary I mean there was a parent here who was frustrated about a sport and she said you know they should have known because there are all these kids in the pipeline and that's so easy to look at but I don't always think that that is true because kids can be playing a sport in town or in elite leagues or whatever and not like the program here or not like a specific mm -hmm. coach or not want to play with their peers here or only want to play for their elite team or whatever it is and the numbers can be small even though it looks like a big cohort. Yeah. So I think it really has to do with who signs up. But, but I think that the, what that mother was saying, I get where she's going with that and I understand what you're saying too, but I think that can give you a general idea of this is popular right now. This is going to be a popular sport when these kids come in. Yes, some will trickle off and do elite, and some will, you know, might want, you know, blah, blah, blah. But if you see that, you know, girls lacrosse in the middle school age is big, chances are you're going to have a lot of interest when they get to high school. I, I think, think it varies, but yeah. I think it varies on the margin, but I think overall it's probably, that's a decent indicator not to ignore. I think that's where she was going with that. So I agree you, with that. So are we comfortable saying there's an interest at the school committee level that middle school and high school are separate, and we'd like you to explore how that could work and what the costs would be. Budget has to play into every decision and every suggestion that comes. Like I really think it's important that whatever this task force does, that they understand the confines of our budget. Yeah. So well, we had to be defined separate too. I mean, that's another. Yeah. I think yeah. one of their main goals, people who got on the committee, is that they want a dedicated AD and we don't have the budget for that. Yeah. So. so can I make a suggestion? I'm going to go back to Carolyn's original point. Perhaps the starting point that I would like to see is for, some, is for the task force to define the goal of what is their goal for athletic programs within Manchester, Essex, Middle and High Schools. And the reason why... I think that is Trisha's starting. Okay. And the reason why I like that is as the conversation has flowed, I know budget constraints but I, there's a pretty diverse, the high school, middle school, athletics are around physical activity. There's a pretty diverse population, whether, whether I look at it from gender and there's the girls sports, the boys sports, the level, of, the level of athletic ability. There's definitely a lot more elite programs now that kids can get into. 
Um, I'd like to comment about the YMCA because they have a perspective on offering programs that are not mandated and they don't have a giant crowd in Beverly that's saying, you better offer youth soccer or we're not going to come to the Y ever again. Um, you also have to the constituency, and part of my concern is there are a number of parents I didn't grow up, I'm not that, that are very passionate sports parents and I respect that, but I feel at times there needs to be some outlet for the non-passionate sports parents. I've got kids that if they fall out of the thing going into middle school, I'm like, they're never going to play a sport in high school because mm -hmm. the bar is so high and they're not going to, they're going to be so intimidated, they're not going to get, get by that. Um, so that's just kind of where I'm at. Is this a, okay, this we're going to run an athletic program because we need to carry the banner of this how we do athletics or what's the overall goal? So I'm like into school. how I would like the middle school to be run is like how our, our, our theater programs now run through the Y. I mean, that was lacking. Um, I think there are a lot of people in the community who are looking for the middle school age kid, just looking for them to have something to do after school yeah. and yes. through the school and, and build more of a community. So if we had, and it could be, and they're willing to, to pay like they did for the, the plays and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I think, and I think that Patricia is looking for direction from the school committee as to what our philosophy really is for the middle school and then she wants to build from that. I don't think she was looking for us to just that was my takeaway yeah. from that last meeting. She wants to know what we believe middle school should be. It should be so part of the middle school model. I think yeah. if you took what you just said here and gave it to her, Sarah's recommendation is her answer. It's oh not the high God. school principal's decision about what becomes of middle school. Her question is, do you want me to still do you want us to still maintain middle school option within the high school program, which is what exists now? So you know, we talk a lot about it, and it's a high school program. So that's why she's managing it. That's mm -hmm. why it's under her purview right now. But if we're looking at creating an option or thinking about backing out middle school students, that's a middle school principal question. Yeah. So Joanne should be on her own group with her own parents yeah. trying to, to map the way. And they may come up with an argument that there's value for some of our students to be able to access the high school teams. Because it... It, and if she wants to make that argument developmentally, I think that should be had with folks at that level and not have the high school backward dictate whether they get something or not. I agree. Right. I have one last point to make, and this is just goes to we, what we as a district want. I'm going to make a stereotype. A lot of sports are about rules. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are, here's the rules, and I think as I look at the minutes, I wasn't here for the last time. Well, how about this? Well, how about this rule? I just look at the administrative overhead of We've got MIA rules to contend with. We've got a how do we manage these kind of what's a, again, from a goals level philosophy, how much are we tied into rules and outside organization structure and spending and here's how you have to do it as opposed to having some control over kind of like the overall program. And I, I look at this when I see the number of sports, and I don't know how many are offered at the high school between girls teams mm -hmm. and boys teams, 12, 15? Oh, was it 18? Yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a lot. And there's also the question to be asked about, are we spreading ourselves too thin? Should we more, be more focused? These are kind of like that high level goal, like are we doing the right thing? What's, what's the philosophy? I have another feedback for you to take back to the task force. Okay. So um, once we start out the whole middle school. Uh, uh, one of the things that came up was school spirit. Yeah. And not that all school spirit is definitely not all about sports. And like she said, maybe uh, a lot of your team, so many of your kids are involved in mm -hmm. sports that they're not at the thing. But I think also school spirit is not all about the sports. And somehow the athletics program needs to foster in the athletes a sense of uh, spirit and inclusiveness for the kids who are not participating in sports because there does seem to be a big divide in both middle and high school between the sporty kids and the kids that aren't participating in sports. And I don't know, you know, how to best bridge that, but I think that should be um, I think that's a part of it. It's part of the bigger, discussion. That's a bigger American discussion. Culture. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. culture, you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I think that it falls under partially Absolutely. how the athletes are coached. coached. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. Yeah. So let's yes. talk about that a little bit. Because I, I don't know if all of our coaches are on board with core values of our, and I think that that to me, like that's the discussion I really want to have, 
which is, do our sports teams really abide by core values? Do they live the way we say we live in the classroom? And I don't, I don't. But do those my, kids live that way in their homes? But we're not. This is. Not, I know, that's <laughs> what I'm just saying. So it's just it's the bigger, it's the big. No, no, no. But but this I'm, is a yeah. school program. But I'm going to push back a little director. A little yeah, and, we, and I'm going to use an example from last week, and this may be controversial and it may not be the right thing to say, but I went to the concert again. Mm -hmm. And you go, and I think it's bigger than our coaches mm -hmm. and our athletics program. Mm -hmm. Our place was packed to start, but as soon as someone's age group performed, that place clears out. Yep. So as a community, we don't have the spirit to sit through the entire program to watch other people's children perform or just to enjoy one of the really one, I mean, the program is off the chart. We're doing fantastic work there. There's wonderful things to see. People put their heart into preparing for this. But by the time you get to the band, the place is empty. I'm going to push back a little more, though. Empty. Well, and that's I, I, can I, can I, I, I don't, have been, I don't feel I have been, can I, I do chime not, in? Because that happens at all levels, yeah. elementary. I mean, it's, yeah, but yeah, it was my been, turn. I don't have a kid who participates in sports, and I have been to various sporting events. Mm -hmm. There was not one parent or one student who does not have a musician who showed up at the concert. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I know. I'm just saying to the broader message, like, yeah. how are we messaging to yeah. the kids right. overall, which is we want our kids to go to the play if they're a if they're an athlete and we want our kids to go to charity. I don't care if they're not, they don't go to the play. I just want them to be nice to the kids who are in the play. But we don't stay for one another's things as the adults in the community. Yeah, so that's true. we're messaging to them that that's okay, but yet we want to see a lot of school spirit. Yes. So I guess part of the problem with that is everybody is so goddamn busy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I don't think we can legislate. But you're yeah, so as as their time, and yeah. I don't think we should. No, but, no, but there's, a, there's a kindness. The that's true. I agree, but we're now taking it on. I mean, I've got a school, school that's kind of trying to figure out why they keep telling us we don't have spirit. And I see a community that's actually creating the culture where you go and you do your thing and you go. So how do you expect us as the school to fix the community mm -hmm. outlook? And so I guess that that's the, I don't, I don't want athletics to fix the problems. I really don't look, but I do want them to live the values. Mm -hmm. And so when my kid is participating on a team and may not be the best performer, or may have, I want the kids who are the high performers to treat them with respect and kindness. And I think that that, I've had parents come to me and say, this is, this stuff's happening on a team and it's not cool. Sounds like um, but there's, but that's a leadership problem. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's, you know, it's part of that social emotional conversation yeah. we've been having. Oh, we have our part to do. Yeah, and we had a really good meeting, and I don't know who was with me, but um, we met with the woman from New from Newburyport. I was with Lynn, and um, she said I met with a bunch of coaches, and we talked about what value did you know what did you get out of sports, and they had to write it on the wall, and you know training was one, skill development, and it was like self esteem and. All the stuff that was that were soft skill, social emotional things were packed, and what they really get out of that is teamwork. Yeah. And those things are important. And I know that that's happening. And what's Annie Edmond's role in New Report? She is it's an entire organization yes, I know, of the community I know. that wraps around right and helps to promote <clears throat> the community values. Yes, so and I get it. So we're missing that piece. Yes. Yeah. I also think that part of Nancy's presentation was about, and she used her herself when she was in the AD role as a model, mm -hmm. that she coached everybody up. Yep. That part of her job as an AD yeah. was we don't have to, that resource. and yeah. we don't have we don't an have AD who has uh, that AD path, that you know, yeah, forward looking, pulling coaches up, getting them trained, getting the best, you know. I mean, I've, I've had kids, you know, before we had an assistant AD and kids, and, and I think you have too as well. and, and there is a big difference when you have a dedicated AD, and I know we, our hands are kind of tied, but mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't know what the answers are. But did we ever have a dedicated AD here? We had um, Nally, we did. Hardy Nally. Picar we, he um, taught part of the time. Yeah. Yeah. I. I'm just saying, I'm like, just not an assistant and an assistant, you know, a dual role. Well, going back thing. to the items that you sent us, when you look at those philosophies. They, you know, they say them three different ways, but basically it says the same thing. 
we have a core mission. We have a core philosophy where you treat one another fairly with kindness, you know, all that same stuff, worded differently, but the same message. We don't have that anywhere. And if that message could somehow feed from our overall mission statement and they tie together, I think that would be important. That needs to be said on the website, it needs, the coaches need to literally sign something, buy into it, however you want to structure it. But I think everybody needs to be held accountable to whatever our mission statement is going to be. Student athletes do sign, they do, a, sign, they do sign a piece of paper yeah. that says that. Yeah, oh, I know that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't. yeah. So. I think the coaches are also answering to a lot of different people. I mean, mm -hmm. the, you know, whether their kid is sitting on the value. bench. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, but it's I mean, tough in a community like them. this where you have a lot of resources for kids to do club sports, elite sports, travel, this and that, and then you have other ones that just want to have fun. It's a it's a huge mix and it's a huge, and every coach I've talked to has really struggled with that. Mm -hmm. And perhaps they need, like, Coaching. they need a mandate. Yeah. They, yeah, yeah, they just need to figure out, like, okay, you know, and I think, I think they kind of are doing the best that they can, but Within there the needs direction. to probably be more of like a charter and more of a policy. So, yeah. How are we going to take on the issue of when you just said, like, when you get to the high school level, like, what is our philosophy there? But I think, it, you know, it, I don't think the philosophy, go ahead. Thank you. Are, are, I don't know if we're going to get into that debate now, but is it going to be a cut, no cut, or is the high school, you're still learning at that point, or are we getting them prepared for, are we like a real athletic program? I mean, that all has to be talked about, too. That, big enough. I thought that the that was going to be... Uh, per sport. Yes. I think it has to be fluid. Yeah. Okay, yeah. How many kids you touch now? So would you do I that? Would you just call it at the beginning of the season? So, forgive me, I have a dumb question, and I'm an American, and I should know this. You haven't mentioned elementary schools at all. Is this a typical model? And I guess I don't understand how it came to be where elementary school seems to be community organizations and volunteer stuff that does and then you get into more formalized and the high schools expected to be full on and the middle schools some sort. Is that everywhere or how do, how do we get I think everything's just gotten so early. I mean, when we yeah. were kids, it was like you kind of ran around and played in elementary school and maybe you did a team here. Middle school is where you learn to play. I right. learned to play lacrosse and field hockey. You did? You didn't school. have teams? No, but not really. Really? What yeah. do you think the kids you guys thought? Only in high school. Five-year-old soccer. I think it's, it's was not with more sports, kids. Which yeah. is yeah. instructional, <laughs> develop, and then, yeah. and then developmental, and then you develop them into feeder programs and then I think by about middle school kids start to either get passionate about it mm -hmm. some are just picking it up but then the high school is totally competitive sports yeah, yeah. MIA is interscholastic sports full on, comes, full yeah. on rules full on oh, I yeah. mean if you read through the book it's all about not recruiting and not yeah. having the edge mm -hmm. and, and playing but by it's the different rules because we have you know but the like girls across, we have varsity, <laughs> JV, and freshmen. And I guess the, expe the, the expectation yeah. is that every school district that's worth its salt needs to field a competitive high school program in whatever it chooses or has the wherewithal. And that isn't enough. So there's, like you've mentioned, there's a lead and there's other. So there's no mandate. Flipping forward to what we'll talk about after. There's no mandate to have sports. From the state. But there is program. no. I do not know of a school. It I've never heard of a school. That yeah. does not have a full blown. So the rules here are all from the MIA. Well, yeah, I mean, nothing from where you get OCR and the play rest. In right. college, so it's 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 Sorry, serious for them. It's to play serious at the high school level. Yeah, and when you go to cut, it's going to get more serious. Yeah, and that's okay. It's fine for it to be that, and if it's announced that that's what it is, and people know going in that you're trying out for eighth spot on the team, I think it's going to. It's going to stop some of the argument about people being carried on the team who don't get playing time because you're only going to carry the people who you're going to want mm -hmm. to play. And then there'll be different variations on how much time. That only works with big numbers. You know, we don't have. So let me ask this. I don't. But, but that would be like saying the school will only invest money in the top academic people in high school and everybody else has to find their own way. I think there should be alternatives. I think there should be. Um, even in the high school, I think there should be programs after school that involve, and there are, like everyone, like, like a flag really football, everyone can do. Which is just for or, fun. Yeah, flag yeah. football, ultimate frisbee. Yeah. Um, track. They're not as competitive, but fun in right. murals. Yeah. Well, let me ask you this, stepping back a minute, when we talk yeah, about wanting have. to separate. I know. Huh? We no, those are things we already fun, have. We can't yeah. pay for it. Those yeah. are things we already have, frisbee and mm, track. They go in and, and out. Frisbee's not working. But what if we had well, we a group of kids that just district. wanted to do an intramural sport and we teamed up with the Y and we did spring 
and fall and winter. You know, and parents can pay out of pocket, 60 bucks a kid or whatever. And just, I want my kid doing something after school, but I don't, they don't, they're not that competitive, they don't want to do lacrosse, or they feel like they missed the boat on this, or whatever, but they just want to be involved every season. So could we ask the task force to, to explore yeah, that? I think that would that be a great thing to consider. Yeah. Can we also ask? It's, there, but it's the not. Task, the task force is it's being not MIA, to it's not come up with the action yeah. and implement the recommendations. Like a fun kind so of after school thing. I think just data wise, you've got 75% of the kids playing sports. So you've only got about 100 kids left <laughs> to create intramurals for. So I don't know if there's going to be enough of a demand. And I think kids if have other passions, and that's will. okay. But too. you know what? If, if you and build it, they may come. I mean, well, if there and, may and be kids that are just being pushed into something. 75% are playing at least one sport. Or 75% are playing Probably just one, every right? one season. Do you remember the stat? Right. It's more than one. OK. They got an average. It was so one to two 1.8 1. 1. or something like that. Plus but there are also kids who have different passions, and that's all right, yeah. too. Like, they don't want to play sports yeah. after school. They want to But they want to maybe run lines. But our data shows yeah. that, they, yeah. that the majority of them are. I mean, the but the majority of them are. I mean, 75 percent of them are. So I don't know that they're being pushed into it because there's a cost right. associated. Right. I mean, so no, but I mean, they may be feeling like, like that's, oh, you know, I need to do that because, because my mother, I have a child who couldn't have well, paid to participate yeah. in that sport, so never mind me. One, one other question, think, too. Sorry. Just, I'm sorry, just when we talk, we do, do talk about we can't fund what we have and all the rest, is there any sort of number that, okay, high school is X amount comes out of the district budget, X amount comes from the parents. Mm -hmm. Okay, given this amount of money that's spent, I have no idea if there's benchmarks. Hey, here's what's a reasonable amount to expect for that. I mean, is it high? Is it low? She talked about that in the report. Okay, she she said it was pretty typical. It was mm -hmm. one, one to one point five percent of the budget, and that was pretty really three percent. We we're like actually getting. She said a big bang for our budget. Okay. Yeah. 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 Patricia has the numbers and yeah, we're thinking to a split of general fund to fees. So, do you have enough to go on, or do you feel like we've answered the question that we were supposed to answer tonight? I mean, you've got a sense of where we're going. With this. I'm just going to keep reporting back to you guys yeah. what gets discussed. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that we all have 100% aligned yes. thoughts. But so I think we're all on the same page that we want middle school to be more of a middle school experience, right? Completely, and you know what we and I have a pretty clear idea of what we do and don't have the budget for. Yeah, and I'll let you know what arises. I mean, I, I think there are going to be some drum beats beating really loudly in that task force. Yeah. How big is it? How many people? There were like 18. Yeah, wow. 20. And when does, when do you have your first kickoff meeting? Um, next week, maybe? Okay. So if we had any other ideas, I guess we could feed them to you? Or oh, yeah. Uh, Email me anytime. So I'm going to connect with Joanne and see when we reasonably could put together a group. Uh, the first of February. Exactly. To talk about the future of middle school sports. Can I mm. ask one question relative to what you brought up before about the smaller class sizes? So when we get to, you know, many years down the road with high school having smaller class sizes, maybe, maybe not, and the possibility of lots of difficulty being able to field those teams, then do we get into a situation where they waver in middle schoolers and then we're right back to the same conversation? I would rather yeah, it's school school be a, a <laughs> JV team be just varsity that year. Or some, sometimes they can't field a varsity team. Yeah, then that work gets cut. Yeah. They can't field a varsity team. So I think I you're trying to do everything for yeah. everybody yeah. and there's yeah. going to have to be so some hard. tough decisions. Yeah. Because yeah. if, in my mind, if you yeah, do either. philosophically believe that it's not developmentally appropriate to have middle school students in competitive sports, which is what the MIA is, then you wouldn't be waving them up. That's if you believe that at all costs yeah. we must field teams because I don't want to have to cut the football team because there'll be a community outcry about it, so let's recruit the seventh and eighth graders to play, then you're designing to have competitive sports at all costs and you're overriding your belief system mm -hmm. for the middle school. So these aren't one night discussions, I don't think. This, I mean, really what you're looking at is are you going to, what does the principal say? What's her recommendation? Because she's better suited to it than I am. But I see it as, a, it, as an educational philosophy about, it, it's, are you just using the middle school kids to fill places on the team, but also fulfilling a desire among some to have their kids get into competitive sports early? So it's kind of a win-win, because you both want something. Um, 
but are we negating what we say is our philosophy of middle school development by doing that? Well, they, and I will speak for those parents. They don't want their middle school. They do not want their sixth, seventh, eighth graders playing football or soccer with high school. They, they don't. Mm -hmm. I think people are wanting something middle for school. the middle school. But I think we need to get the middle school. And I don't think we should call yeah. it sports because then it's not going to be. Activity. To me, that sounds like the high school. We're just going to create something mm -hmm. for you know, middle school sports, JV. Blah, blah. So I think we need to come up with a do Nancy's recommendations were good. I think she yeah. called it activities. Oh, she did? Yeah, there you go. I think, I mean, I'm just going to, I think every rule has an exception. So maybe there's a philosophy that the middle school has activities and the high school has sports. And maybe occasionally there's an eighth grader who's a stellar athlete and there's a spot on the high school team and maybe occasionally there's a waiver, but it's the exception rather than the rule. So we I would not want to go there. Can I just Explain waiver. We don't waive for kids. We waiver waive for the numbers. Team. to get numbers. numbers to have a team. Mm -hmm. So we apply to MIAA to say we do not have enough students in field hockey to field a girls field hockey team just for um, the high, just using the high school. Can we incorporate? To yeah, you make have numbers? to appeal to them. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that's for to make a JV team or a varsity team. A competitive, a, comp team. Competitive team. Yeah. a competitive team. Yeah. I feel like if there aren't enough high school teams, that then you just don't have it. High school kids. I don't. Yeah. I mean. I think it's a tough call, and I think that's what she said when she was here, that they were in a situation where she was in Lincoln with the girls' ice hockey, and they didn't have enough, but they had all these older kids who so really, really, really wanted to have a team, and, and she said it was a really tough decision. Well, what we've done in those cases is combine with another school. Yeah. So we have ice hockey with Gloucester and Rockport. So other options. Yeah. 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 Okay, I want to keep moving. So you're okay. comfortable with what you've got? Great. And then we'll keep talking to Joanne about yep. I can't believe I have so much to say about sports. I know. What about that? So right. opinions. Is there a way we could get the actual athletics report with the appendices? Because that kind of got cut off in the last one. It was missing like the first page and the last page. I think we have yes. it. Thank um, you. And you'll get a binder okay. on the first of everything. Yep. Because there's that page back. So superintendent's report, is this going to all blend into budget update? Is that how we're going to do this? Yeah, or? we'll start with good news and just go to, into that. Someone um, wrote you a big check. <laughs> <laughs> you won the No, no I just, I kind of weaved a couple of things in. Just we're, we are cranking along with rulers. So when you think about core values and charters and trying to have that trickle down, um, that's going well. Uh, we're, we're leveraging all of our PD days for that. And then I got to just give the shout out for the middle, for the, uh, music program. It is really, really taking off. And if you didn't stay for the concert, they were fantastic. I mean, there's just a lot of pop mm -hmm. and a lot of energy in what they're doing. And I think the structural changes we made to the feeder program are really starting to pay off and it's going to just get better. And, better. and Mrs. Nano did an outstanding job. Yes, she did. She was the robot voice and the robots will rule the world piece. Can I just make a suggestion? It would yeah. be ever possible to mix up what grades go when, <laughs> rather than start with the youngest, go to the oldest, and of course go before band. I think they're working on that. Yeah. I know. Yeah, that I think the theory is they're showing the development. Like they start here, and here's where they end up yeah. by the time, and they do more pieces when they're older. As a newbie, never having got the philosophy or the town values, is oh, it's okay. I'm here, so I just has been the general vibe that I picked up from that. So you're right. It is. It is rude, and it's. Not there, but I'm wondering. This should be simple to It starts district. in the elementary school. Yeah. Yeah, it does. That's what I mentioned earlier. What, what concert was there this week? It was well, a it was course in band. I can remember when the, they used to have the joint concert and one, one town's band would play and then the, yeah. those people would leave and that was really a bummer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe they just say, you, you're here, you have to stay the whole... Let's, or you can just, I mean, I know that that's, people won't that. like that. But or you can just make it an, you know. There is kind of a mass kind of exodus. Yeah. And it's very disconcerting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It makes you feel bad. Yeah. Or an announcement yeah. at the yeah. beginning. Yeah. We're not or an announcement, of, but a, just a, or no a reassertion no of time kind of like. Really. <laughs> just I've been popping on that for years. They have yeah. to have they, a, they can't a lot of people just, yeah. A lot of people say, why don't, yeah, they always say, why don't they put the band first for once, you know? And that's the whole risers and the, yeah. But it, I, I do think it's this something a break, that needs to be They've gotten the with. breakdown. It's really quick. I mean, mm -hmm. we, Maybe we could get somebody to write an article for the cricket. Yeah. Like, not one of us, but somebody else. So they're doing stage. great. And I think you know we have a district elementary band now. Because in our restructuring, Richard now does instrumental 
lessons and band coordination for the whole district, mm -hmm. they've moved to having a blended band. How do they do that? He practices them separately, then they do then they a couple together. of joint and do performances together. Oh, that's here. nice. Yeah, it's great. Really nice. So it's coming along. Um, I was going to let With you know. With chorus too, though, don't they? Yes, it's a chorus. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. Um, the High School Athletics Task Force launches on February 1st. They're going to come back to us with their um, recommendations, but we just talked about that. <laughs> we all need to say thank you, Julie. Yeah, thank yes. you, Julie. And Matt. And Matt. I do think it's going to be a rough, a bumpy ride till we get to the end, because everybody sees it. Can we give you a helmet to go into the <laughs> I've got a goalie hockey helmet. I'll fundraise for one. <laughs> and then I know you mentioned... Um, uh, it's called No. Mom brain. Uh, resource officer at the beginning, there being some discussions about yes. that. It, yeah. Related to it is we've just, um, just so you know, we continue to do our, our quarterly safety meetings, site walkthroughs, and ongoing preparations for crisis and emergency planning, hoping that we'll never have to that use That came up part. at the FinCom meeting that I went to when you guys were all at a building committee meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just all the minutes. Yeah, and I was like, excuse me, whose budget would that fall in? And they were like, yours. I was like, that? It's not possible then. If they like to adjust us about half percent, exactly, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, um, I think we are on board. I don't know that uh, anyone disagrees with the need for having a resource officer, but well, I don't know if we're all in agreement on that. The leadership team is very supportive of having a resource officer. I think we do twenty-four-seven. I mean, like we all day. do a lot of work and have a lot of occasion to work with the police. Um, so having someone in the schools would be a help, someone dedicated and trained and knowledgeable of our systems and students and willing to form relationships with them might be very helpful with some of the things that we do deal with. Um, but it's not in the budget plan. It, there's no place for it, so it's kind of something that keeps getting put on the deferred list. Um, and we debated this in school council last year, or high school. And the feeling and there was, was um, kind of not so much pro, a little con, hmm. which was interesting um, because the new, it, it was prompted, the whole discussion was prompted by the new um, chief of police here in Manchester and he came in and was sort of pitching the idea and um, there was a lot of mixed feeling about it. So I've got mixed feelings. It doesn't yeah. feel like a part of an educational program, it feels part like part of a surveillance. Well, like it, it was, mm -hmm. it was, I mean, we, we can, talk more about it, but it was, um, some people felt, he, he, part of the pitch was that it was um, for kids who are interested in law enforcement, they could actually, he to have sort of an open door policy, you could come and, you know, I mean, I have a lot of notes on it, actually, mm -hmm. that I could share with the group, but, um, but it was, you know, so it would provide kids who maybe don't want to go on into, you know, a traditional college, um, you know, college and then a career, what have you, they can go in if they're interested in law enforcement, mm -hmm. but then, it was, we had a lot of questions about like, where would his office be and what would he be plain clothes and da, 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 you know. So it was very, um, very mixed. And that was, that's all, hmm, you know, school niche. council. So that it was like a really small hole. And the other thing was that Trisha's um, experience with it was at a much, much bigger school. Mm -hmm. Everybody who had a, a positive experience, it was a really big school. And we all decided that it, the consensus was is that our school is really small. Mm -hmm. and need. Yeah. Um, well, so, if you want to go down the road, we can bring in some of the team members and we can talk about it. I think the yeah. perception that we're small and there's not a need, Right. I would say right. that with the volume of complaints, investigations, and calls to police, issues around residency, school avoidance, getting right. kids here, perceptions about drugs and dueling, they could be tremendously helpful. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, mean, this was that, sort of before the opiate. Yeah. I mean, there was, there's obviously been some more recent stuff. So, I get this surveillance state thing with marijuana becoming legalized. That's just going to be it's a whole new level of liability that I see that comes into the schools. There was a... Yeah, this was all pre -jewel. So it's yeah. Just, yeah. I think there are pros and cons. Yeah. There are absolutely. pros and cons, but I definitely see, I would like to hear the pros, and I definitely see it. I don't know if it's a full-time only or, but some... There were lots of questions. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that we didn't get completely yeah. fully but answered and then we were like well we don't have the budget right now so we kind of left but the table. We kind of got yeah. plenty of time yeah. to figure but out. But yeah. hearing about it from hearing that professionals are interested in it and knowing again if it comes up FinCom, it's one of those areas that I think. Why would FinCom, yeah. why are you looking for, the Harbor Master is looking for a 
I think someone to help for more. Someone for the summer. Yeah, well, he's looking for more help in the summer, and yeah, I think he may be able to back on with us cool. during the school year to be able to share your position. Is what yeah. they were talking yeah. about. I think in our conversations, we're pretty explicit that it has to be the right person. Mm -hmm. It has to be someone who is trained to do the work of um, adolescents and, yeah. and young students and understand the different needs at the different levels. So it's not just um, a skipper on it, the water. It's yeah. not just, you know, any. It's like anybody. when we would pick a teacher, it's not just everybody can walk through the door and create good relationships with kids and have it be successful. You have to have the right set of skills, and that's kind of where we've become. Okay, so that's a bigger discussion. Yeah. You had one thing you wanted to say on that? Sorry. No, it was a rabbit hole. It was just Okay, <laughs> I think that if you Sorry. want to talk about that, I'd rather have a structured conversation. Yeah, that's fine. It. Great. They can work themselves yeah. up. Yeah, there was a talk about yeah. retirement. I don't need them yeah. having to do much. I would want someone. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Those are my notes. Those. What's we do wrong? need. Oh. We ready to kind of settle in on the budget and where where we're at? I think it's laser real quick. There you go. Oh, thank you. Okay, I want to do three things. Where we were last week, where we're trying to get to. Um, if it's helpful. Oh, I have this for you, too. So one on the far left. Okay. So three things. I'm going to take you, we're going to take you through where we, how we're trying to close the gap. Mm -hmm. We have put together a mandated costs attempt. So we want to talk to you and get some feedback on that. Because that, you would think it was a very simple thing to do. But it gets messy quick, so I'm, I'm worried about the cleanness of it. Um, and then we'll we'll wrap up with ideas you might have about a couple of things um, under program and staff here. Um, Thanks. Ways to find some additional help. So I think what we knew last week was that we were going to we agreed to create um, even if it's just in name a sped earmark within reserves to cover any out of district, um, any unexpected or to cover the projected but not actual out of district numbers for next year. So very quick reminder, Allison, build, Allison Collins builds in a um, projected number of possible heads going out of district for next year and assigns a value to that. And we usually carry that in the budget as money that may never need to be used, but, but is there for an emergency. And more often than not, we're able to use that money for other things. And last year, it was this money that we used to reduce the budget in April when we got the very late health care numbers. So what we thought we would do going forward was earmark $200,000 within reserves to take care of these issues in FY19 should they actually come to be, knowing that we would have to have a matching cut in FY20 um, because we can't rely on uh, reserve funds year in and year out. So essentially what it does is it prevents us from having to make um, staffing and program cuts to fund something that may never come to be. Uh, retiree health offset. We're plugging that in as $50,000, and we're still, oh, that should be four. We are still looking at a um, assumption adjustment of only $75,000. So there hasn't been any real movement in the health care number since then. So when we take our reduction through attrition by not replacing projected retirement, so those will be staff cuts, but there will be no impact to anyone employed because we're taking them through people who are retiring. We are now looking at a reduction of $225,000 just to close the gap for this year. We looked at a couple of transportation options and have an update there. We are looking to go forward with the full day K on Wednesdays by el and eliminate a bus run for $8,000. We are still committed to eliminating late buses for $25,000. Um, Talking with Joanne and Tricia, we have about 15 students who use the late bus in the afternoon. So while we don't want to limit services, 
it seems to have a mi you know minimal impact. That's a lot of money. That's yeah. a nice. That's a nice savings. Is but is that fifteen thousand that primarily Essex students? There are a number of Essex students at middle school level. Yeah, that's just the only concern that I have. That's what I have. Geographic separation. Yeah, it's tough. I think. Yeah. Again, none of these are things that we would want to do, but right. we're looking at minimal impact. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, we're not getting a lot of positive feedback that it's going to be possible to eliminate a bus run. Um, they said no in general, now they're looking at eliminating service within a mile and a half, but they have been slow to get back to us and not optimistic about making that happen. But we'll keep you posted. Because they're not, they don't seem to think it's possible, we've taken it out as a possible savings. We have solar savings, so the, and I'm just going to give you a little update before you leave on the installation of the solar panels here at the middle high school. We're booking $10,000 in um, savings there. Also great success with the Essex Green Community upgrades at Essex Elementary. I think they're projecting a higher number, but to be safe, Bobby says, let's use 10000 as a savings for the year. Um, but every little bit helps, so we're going to put it in there. Is that really true? You're going to save ten thousand dollars in Essex next year? Possibly. Like, really? That that's the you know the projection comes from them looking at um, at the energy usage. So I mean, yes, that's their estimate. They have they basically look at um, uh, kilowatt hours and then they uh, or therms and then they look at the market rates and and actually our rates uh, from our bills. And if so we can, if that happens. We need to be singing about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm right. going to sing a little bit about that program That's a little bit later because I think I put some notes in the in the vouchers about it, so it's worth just giving a brief mention to it. Either way, it's a great success for a lot of reasons. The high school student activity fee doesn't look like it will bear the fruit we thought it would. Um, Trisha has gone through and taken a look at things, and we're going to keep looking at it. We've reduced it from a $30,000 savings to $20,000, and her thinking currently is that if we look toward a little bit of what the baseball and um, the lacrosse team just did, looking at limiting even further the amount of money that we give toward travel and trips for the bait and DECA and things like that, and just have it be at parent and student expense at this point, we're thinking possibly $20,000. So we're studying it, we're looking at it. Um, again, these are all starting to be things that are going to limit, it feel like they're starting to limit kids' access to it. Um, we're, we're up against it. So we, we, we still we still have the opportunity to support kids who financially can't pay for it, so that resource will always be there, but it does shift some costs. Um, go ahead. Um, I think I like that better than trying to do that activity fee because I feel like we already layered it on the kids with uh, the parking and I don't know, whatever. Their kids, and when the kids are feeling like it's, oh, we have to pay another fee, I don't know. You have to pay up if, before you can go to prom. Mm -hmm. So you have to have it all paid anyway. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but I mean, adding another $100 onto that seems like more. So I'm glad that she's taking that out. Is it? Well, I think it's forty-five now, right? Forty-five per year, per kid. Mm -hmm. Oh, just your That's feet. just for your class prom. That's not for the budget. This would be to underwrite yeah. stipends for things like decorative debate. Class dues, right? It's not no, class dues. No, this is no, not class dues. dues. This so is like to have things year. like um, oh God. the art club, yeah. drama, yeah. like drama, yeah. art club. I'm trying to think of what else we have. Entry fees. Journalism, like things I'm thinking of are more class oriented, and I think that's where she went in her head. Like, would you really charge for National Honor Society? That doesn't seem right. Journalism is a class; you can't charge for a class. Right. Yeah. Um, so there are different things that you just have to start to weed out because it doesn't seem appropriate, and it seems like the driving cost for most of the student activities is travel and entrance fees. Mm -hmm. So you know, maybe doing it a little different than athletics and actually pay as you go. That way there you know what you're paying for. So you're not just putting general dollars in a pot and feeling like you're not getting value out of it. So we're okay. going to continue to talk about that and see how realistic it is to see the impact it might have in the program. That's, a, that's an interesting model when you consider people saying, oh, somebody wants to do a YMCA program or take a music class outside. 
that's all pay as you go mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. things. I mean, things that are national honor. You're right; those are school. And people seem to be fine with the YMCA drama model mm -hmm. at the middle school. People, I mean, that's a significant amount of mm -hmm. money. They say it's expensive. I mean, people definitely complain that it's expensive, but they think they're getting a good value. Their money's worth. Yeah. And they know exactly what they're paying yes. for. Mm -hmm. Can we go back? Are you I have a question about the bus run, but we can yep, come back ahead. to it at the end. Um, so the option, what I know we're not, we didn't want to consolidate runs because that means kids are on the bus for, what do we say, 45, 50 minutes? They're looking minutes. at how we could and don't feel like they can. Okay, but what is the part about, the, can we review the eliminate service within 1.5 miles? Sure, right now we, we charge kids who that. live within one and a half miles mm -hmm. to ride the bus. Right. Because we don't have to provide service within right. one and a half miles. So the question is, if we eliminate service to those students within one and a half miles, right? can you create a consolidated bus run? Oh, so the two go together. Yeah. We also yeah. lose revenue. You would lose revenue. So the question is, if it's right. $60,000 for the run and we get $18,000 for those riders, it's probably still worth it. Yeah. So more to come there. Um, the retirement replacement offset, a very small amount. We think we'll earn back 5000 We talked about that last time. And then the no overtime summer work all departments isn't actually no overtime, but we're looking at slashing that about 50%. So right now we spend about $120,000 on summer work, everything from custodial to guidance hours. Um, there's summer, this is beyond the summer special education required services, but their scheduling work. Sometimes department heads or team chairs pick up hours in the summer. Um, we would look at that budget overall. The curriculum summer work is in there as well. Cut it in half and then go project based. People will have to make a pitch and we'll fund it or not fund it. So. And what does that mean for guidance? I mean, for kids who are you know, doing. It means college. either they'll be available 50% of the time that they had been before or not at all. And you'll have to get it done either the day before, a couple of days before school, or within the end of the year. Well, they run a boot camp for Possibly no. Well, yeah. Yep. So just since this is a public document, can you change the no over time to reflect what that yep. really means? Thank you. Custodial is a big part of it, so we would have to limit projects. Yeah, summer cleaning and painting. It's, a, it's an example of deferred maintenance, essentially. Are you paying for Are you paying for um, the cleaning crews to come in in the summer? Yep, we uh, take pretty much disassemble every classroom, clean it out, and put it back together. And we've been doing that. It's a kind of it's a standard industry. So that project. will still happen. Uh, no, I would say that that would be cut back significantly. So the again. contract folks that you have don't come in during the summer? Uh, a lot of that work actually is done with in-house with a little bit done through the contract. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there's some, it's a little bit of both. We have some um, part-time people who come in to help at, who are not like, um, but uh, it's So it's we wouldn't mixed. be cleaning our classrooms? We would be limited. We would be, you know, it's a deferred, this is a deferred maintenance and deferred cleaning. It doesn't mean that we're not going to do any cleaning, but we would have to Cut that budget Parent volunteers, get in there with your mouse. Yeah, I mean, yes, I, I agree. It's got some concern. It doesn't mean we wouldn't clean it, but I think it means you have to scale back the amount of time and and, and money that you spend on this, uh, yeah. potentially by fifty percent. Okay. So, I, yes, this is. This there is are a lot of things on this list like that are not that things that. These are not things that are in prior years. You know, obviously, a lot of the things that we talk about that we use to close budgetary gaps are things that are efficiencies. I don't think these are efficiencies. These are uh, reductions. And so this, these, that would be an example of a reduction, not an efficiency. And while nobody likes what's on the list, these are st we're still in the minimal impact to program and students right. area. With already having reduced staff by $350,000 coming out of the gate. So we're going to have to be shuffling people around and doing some combinations of service um, on the classroom side too, so it, it doesn't get better as we go down this list. The hiring cap, we've talked about it before, it's just a, you're talking about um, hiring people with limiting the amount of experience you, you're hiring for, so we'll probably be targeting that M3, M5 bracket going forward. 
So that gets us into striking distance if everything comes to fruition that's on this list and leaves us $57,000 to close the gap. What it doesn't do is take care of everything that we may need to add to deal with the enrollment bubble. And I think the focus there is primarily right now in the high school, um, the humanities teacher at 1.0.6 for um, mathematics and 0.6 for STEM is what we're trying to get to. Um, we're also trying to work through some compliance issues around funding the SPED programs to ensure that we have enough teachers to cover the number of heads that we're going to have in the program and all of the profiles. So we're working through that on the side. Um, and what we're starting to talk about is um, how do you get more, how do you get to the plus side in, in this column here? So how do you make the $50,000 go to zero but then start to climb so you have some additional funds to do some of the things that we need to do? So. On the list for consideration is possible additional, that's a mouthful, uh, an additional classroom reduction is a possibility at the elementary level. Mm -hmm. So based on enrollment, we may bring another class down to two sections. Um, I'm not sure if we can realize that in retirement yet or if that would start to look like a cut. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we're going to, I think we'll be able to achieve that. Then we're getting into, should we look at, um, programs that are not the core required courses, but things that we do, we are glad to do them. We think that they have value and importance, but may, may need to be moved out to make room for other things. So things on that list are, are something like elementary foreign language, which is something that is not necessary. It's, a, it's an exploratory Exploratory experience, I think it adds value to the student's day. It's something that enriches them and gives them access and experience with a foreign language. It's not necessary for them to um, reach AP level language work at the high school, so it doesn't act as a direct feeder. If you enter in seventh grade, complete your seventh and eighth grade rotation and then continue on, you will achieve everything that you need to and more to get to college, so we are looking at the K-6 um, possible elimination, reorganization, creating more of an enrichment model um, outside of the school day is a possibility. Again, it's there in theory, it's not there, it's not a formal, it, it's not a formal recommendation at this point, it's more a, these are the things we're starting to talk about and what is your comfort level with them. So if we're not comfortable with, you know, cutting summertime work, how comfortable are we with now looking at program reduction for kids? And then another conversation we should have is, is there a role for reserves? Is this not an issue, a structural issue, but a one-time hit that we need to recover from and we need to slow, slow the bleeding a little bit and give us a couple of years to recover and not try to do it all at once with cuts and use some uh, reserves to to, to close the gap. I would be hesitant, I think, to use reserves and then add staff. So maybe you just use reserves, you close it off, and we have to go without the staff. Why did you here. mention um, school choice when we have some mm -hmm. tiny classes? Because we're cutting enrollment. I mean, we're cutting classrooms because of enrollment. So we're cutting our In places where we're not going to do that, but we have seats. I don't think we have seats. Really have seats. Are there other programs other than um, elementary school foreign language that are not mandated that we could cut, or is that the only one that's really in the? We could cut a lot of things. Um, <laughs> this goes back to your husband's question, right? Like, right. what are the things that you absolutely? You could cut everything from AP mm -hmm. to the arts, mm -hmm. music. Um, we could look at reducing out of the middle school any of the, none of the specialty courses are required. You get to requirements at high school because you need to have certain things, um, a certain level of the credits and um, access to certain courses to be able to apply to at least a Mass State College. But other than that, nothing's required. So we don't have to, you know, this will, this, isn't, this will get people going, but you don't have to offer specials at elementary. We need to have enough specials to give teachers a prep every day. We're slightly over that now, but if you did something with 
the foreign language or reduction of any of them, that's going to take us, one move will take us down to contractual obligation right away. So we've been here before yeah. um, with the foreign language question. And it brings a lot of people out to fight for it. I hate making a decision like this within you know, three week period of time. So I, I don't think you need to do it in three weeks. Yeah. I think this next level, you know, we've talked about it. I think this these are March decisions. I yeah. think we have plenty of time to ponder, think, and watch. Yeah. Um, we could even hold, it doesn't have to be a formal budget hearing, but we can hold a meeting for people to come and give comment on some of these things and absorb, you know, mm -hmm. some of the input. So I don't think this has to be made right away. What I'm trying to let you know is we've got a couple of different avenues to get there, but none of the choices at this point are things that, I mean, we've come with efficiencies in the past that, of course, are never easy because they impact people, but we, also, we thought it was good business mm -hmm. and that there was an upside to doing it. Um, I'm not feeling a lot of upside in any of this because we're not we're not advancing anything. We're really just plugging the hole. Um, you know, even the full day K, there's debate to be had. You know, I think we, we do things differently in each of the schools. Um, we have this reduction because there was a time where we we were in NACI school, so basically it's the accreditation arm for the National Association for the Education Thank of Young you. Children. So the early childhood Ooh. accreditation. And we were supposed to have uh, home visits. I don't know that that's necessary anymore. So that's something that I think we could be okay with and grow out of and increase time in school for kids and okay. But other than that, everything is really, what can we do that, minute, that really impacts the fewest number of people and puts money in, in the bank. So a quick question, too, actually. Um, one's a, a smaller question with regard to the kindergarten and adding that extra half day. We're already paying the staff for that, right? That's that's funded. Okay. Yeah, we're just going to get So my next question is a little bit more difficult and maybe more philosophical. So how comfortable are you saying that um, using reserves to, to address this problem is not a structural issue? That how comfortable are you how confident are you in saying this is a one-time issue and these health care costs trending the way they are are not going to become a structural issue? Not a lot of confidence. No. Yeah. I think it's a t I don't think it's something we can do over and over. I think it buys us time to, to go into negotiation yeah. and try to work through the cause of the problem and find the, the financial solution there. So it basically just stops the bleeding gives us some time, but we may be right back here if we can't come up with a solution. Mm. And then we have that. to cut. And I but it gives us a chance to get there without doing too much damage mm. the first time around. I think it will be interesting, a bunch of us, and if anyone wants to come, I know Rachel and Annie and I are going to the um, meeting at Triton on Thursday about, mm -hmm. oh good, about um, regional school districts. And I think some of this stuff needs to come up there. Mm -hmm. What's great about that meeting is that Bruce Tarr will be there. Oh, like, Annie, you, did you get a response on your email? You a, what did I do? Did you write an email to the larger group? To, to like, Anne Margaret. Anne Margaret. Oh, did I copy you on that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh. oh, I didn't see that. Yeah. Um, I think I just copied Essex people. Essex. She's oh, right. yeah. She's Essex. It was just at the bottom of the email I sent us. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it, sorry. I have no idea what I did. Um, I was just curious. I did not hear from her. But um, they, if we could. Press them about these corners. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so um, just what does that mean in um, the high school? What are you saying? So if we can't get there, what does that look like for that? Just as Bart, just more limited. Yeah, you mentioned there will be studies in the schedule. Yeah. There'll be what? They'll have studies instead of classes. And some. Study hall. They'll, we can provide a base, the core program, but they may not have elective options. So if they don't get an elective option to fill one of their blocks, they would have a study. So they'll have um, you, block. you block and a study. So does that mean they don't get hmm? So does that mean they don't get their elective because it doesn't fit into their schedule, or just because that elective isn't offered? Oh. Because we don't have enough personnel to offer enough electives to cover all the blocks. So. To run the high school, a high school schedule, a high school student schedule takes about 1.6 FTE to run because they take up to eight classes. So that's a person and a half. 
If everyone else knows this, you can tell me offline. No, no, no it's good. Okay. So we don't have enough FTE to have eight, um, eight classes for every student all the time. So that's what, where we start to get into problems. And that's where if you start, you know, sometimes I think the specials are an incredibly important part of the program for the whole child and a well-rounded student. There's also a pragmatic function because that provides that provides part of that extra part of the FTE. So it's a little less at the middle school. Middle and elementary run closer to about 1.2 to run a full schedule for the kids because they don't, because they have less blocks that you need to fill. But those fillers are, it creates the prep time for the teachers that we need to do by contract, but it also provides the enrichment and the exploratory aspect of the schedule for the kids. So it's not really 1 to 22, it's really about a 1.2. To, to fill out the schedule, so it gets a little, it gets cleaner as you get younger, but you start pulling out those pieces, you create holes in the kids' schedules, and then you start to uh, tinker with whether or not you're meeting the obligation of the teachers to get prep time. And we can talk, you know, prep time's necessary, you're teaching five classes a day, you need time to grade, you need time to prepare your lesson, you need time, um, you know, to make sure that you're meeting with your colleagues. Uh, and you're all on the same page. That's how we use the time. So it's not like it's just free time during the day. People are at it all day long. There's meet 504 meetings, IEP meetings, every minute of the day is consumed. So is that going to get harder because I'm running? Yeah. I'm just, yep. Okay, no, I'm not. I do, go ahead. So I'm already hearing people that are in the high school now complain that kids aren't getting into the things that they want to and there isn't enough, blah, blah, blah. So will that even become harder next year with this bigger class? Most likely. So right now it, it is a fun. We always have the function because we're small of having singletons in the schedule. Mm -hmm. So the more specialized courses that you take, the harder it is to get everything to balance. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, I need to take French and band, and they're going to bump up against each other mm -hmm. because that's when they're offered. So I've got to make a hard choice. We're going to layer on that there being fewer opportunities in the day to access certain courses. Mm -hmm. So it's going to get harder. Where That's because we can't add the staffing. Mm -hmm. Where it strikes me is we're at the, this, is, this feels to be, as you've described, I'm putting it in my own words, the tipping point between things that can go on that are somewhat transparent to the parents and the children in the schools and the point where it's now, hey, things that we've come, grown accustomed to or we feel are part of, I felt are part of the academics are meaning to go away. Mm -hmm. And that will probably drive a, some sort of a response from parents and students around, hey, What's going on? We got to do something here. So it's, I guess, in philosophically, I know we're doing this to be able to avoid, or to be able to manage. We've talked about, or I've talked to people about, we're doing this to manage being able to get through the school funding. We don't want to get the two streams crossed up. But this is fairly incredible to go from the 550000 gap to a $50,000 gap. And the questions around, okay, is this going to be sustainable from year to year? resonates because it's next year we're going to be back. We've lost the cushions. We've taken out all the cushions. There wasn't really much cushion to begin with. Well, there was a million and a half in two years is yeah. a lot of money. Well, this, yeah. there was a minute somebody would say, oh, there was a million and a half cushion in there There's and the efficiencies and the rest. Well, out of a 20, 20, $23 million budget. So the question becomes is, and I know we're also, this is the philosophical discussion, from one year to the next, mm -hmm. we're not going to go for overrides. That popular, I know the funding for the schools are going to be there, but there will be some con some contingent or some voice saying, "Hey, the schools, the operating budget is too small now because of the health care. We've got to compensate for that." So I don't know in my own mind. I don't have an answer for you. I'm just this feels like we've hit that point, and quite frankly, you've saved far than I thought you could save. Well, and there's still people in FIMCONs and boards of selectmen who think we need to. Yeah. Good, good hard look at our budget. And, and I think that we could cut another $2 million out of it mm -hmm. and they would still feel the same way. Right. Exactly. But I think it comes back to that at the beginning when we were talking about the, the whatever the online thing with math schools of what's the value that the school provides. Mm -hmm. You know, the cost per student relative to our peer group locally is middle to bad. And we're going to... Speaking of that, <laughs> we need PR. Right. So as part of putting the mandated costs together, we started to look, we needed some numbers, so we took a look at, we're number nine on that Boston list for what that list is worth. 
but if you look at it and you consider we're one of the highest performing districts in the state, what does it look like financially in the other um, high performing districts? And you'll see where we fall. Um, we're close to the state average in both salary and per pupil. And districts who are performing at our level are spending considerably more. Well, so for example, Harvard's paying about $10,000 extra per teacher. If we multiplied that times the number of how many full-time teachers do we have? About 130. Well, so that'd be like $1.3 million, right? Mm -hmm. just, in, just in teachers. So this isn't to say that we should be there because there's a lot going on with what causes the mm -hmm. average number, of course. Um, but if you look at per pupil expenditure, I think we're getting a lot out of the system for a reasonable cost because our cost per pupil is right around state average or a little higher right now, but our outcomes are top tier. Our salaries are not, our salaries are at state average. Yeah. So. I think what that does is kind of answers the question. I don't think there's a lot of waste. I don't think there's a lot of um, mm -hmm. inflated salaries. The health care we know isn't really a function of the plan design. It really is a function of some catastrophic things that happened to people that drove the number up and mm -hmm. we're, we're digging out of that now. So I think this is a good comparable. Um, and even if you flip it to Cape Ann, we are lowest per pupil on Cape Ann. What about administrative? Mm -hmm. And are the schools listed in order of performance? The other top no. No. the other top eight. They're just no. listed alphabet. No, no, it looks like they're in um, order. Uh, cost per pupil. The other nine order. top ten districts. No. No. no, it's all over the place. Yeah. No, we can, I, I can arrange them in order. Um, I think Dover Sherburn was on top. Pam, what about it? We always we talk a lot about an average teacher salary. What yep. about administrative salary? Salaries. That's a good question. Are they piled because in there? Uh, I'm curious. They're I've never people. seen that data. Uh, okay. They're not in the average teacher salary. No, yeah. I know, but I'm yeah. talking about administrators. So if we did, yeah, like, across no, no, the yes, they're in there. They're not in oh. there. So yeah. if we did if admin salaries against this group, we'll be on the bottom. We where? On the bottom. On the bottom. Going back to the comment you just made about like, catastrophic the issues and digging ourselves out of a hole. Is it just such a big hole because it's magnified because we're so small? It's a big hole because we have to pay hundred and yeah. one million and no, five hundred thousand dollars. No, but on a bigger budget, that wouldn't hurt as much. That sure, wouldn't. sure it would because it would be a bigger number. But catastrophic. A twenty-eight percent increase in health care to Wellesley is no, going to. No, I'm talking about absolute dollars. I think she's saying you're, you're, if you have one person or if you have a few this same quantity of claims in Wellesley. Yeah, but statistically in Wellesley you're likely to have more of these type of claims. That's because of the law of large numbers. Yeah. yeah. But realistically, even outside of this health care issue, easy. we have had an issue. I mean we have been talking about this for eight years. Mm -hmm. All the things that we the nice to haves, we mm -hmm. can't get there. Mm -hmm. So even outside of the health care, we were fighting the past four years for money. Yeah, yes. so it's just we're even. I feel that like in yeah. some of those towns, there's a culture where they, the towns have decided to really invest a lot in their schools. Yes, and they, they also have larger have commercial same. districts that are supporting. Yeah, yeah no, I know yeah. for a variety of reasons. Yeah. So Pam and Abby, yeah. uh, one percentage of our budget is what? Hmm? Sports. I'm talking about the. the <laughs> 20, 20, 20, what is it like? Sounds like. About 220, right? 220. About 1% of our budget. What is the question? What is the 1% of our budget? Oh, we said 25 million dollar budget. But 200. So if we wanted some help this year, would it be a? If we wanted to ask the towns for, you know, this year a little bit of help. What would it be? What would be the ask? Would it be 57? Whatever they could give. Okay. Well, we, yeah. I think clearly I'd one like of the steps of the process is to go through what we're dealing yeah. with. And so I think that's kind of, we're doing that here first, obviously. But we haven't even gotten to that level of the conversation. Right. I would like to avoid program cuts. Yeah. But I think any give is also going to turn into. I think we're also in a difficult spot because we have to, 
I think we need to, to make some more reductions because ideally we do want to add some staff and to ask them to give to dig us out of a hole while we're also trying to add we've got to bring more to the table we do is there is any there news on health care 14 uh, from si versus 16 yeah we're at 14 right now uh, you know Unless to be honest uh, big picture I can say that we are seeing that the crazy problems we're having I think have subsided now we're just dealing with the fact that we don't have as many good months compared to the past months so they'll look at two years of trend and so we have more recent months are, are doing better uh, they're not amazing but they're definitely better so that that kind of that hockey sticking is behind us but we're still not out of the woods and so I, I don't know if we're gonna get much lower than 14 we could but it's at this point I I don't feel comfortable. When is it locked in? Huh? When is it locked in? Probably in, in about a month to two months in that range. Um, 14% the night of the okay. Okay. Manchester Town meeting. Yeah. The other thing, just to Pam's point, I mean, I putting my quantitative and budget line item hat on, I mean, we're dealing with this problem because of health care. That's the source of this issue. Now, there's all sorts of reasons why we provide health care and why it's important to our employees, et cetera, but uh, that, you know, we're cutting other things because we don't have the choice to deal with that. So to me, it seems like if you do start getting into conversations with funding entities about how and when they can support us, I think one of the first questions they would ask you is, well, let's talk about the source of your problem for a minute. And I don't think that that's a question of out of control spending mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. frivolity or kind of bad attitude or anything it's just it's a big line item it's got to be negotiated there are mandates involved it's not easy to deal with and so I think we need that that takes work to kind of look at that and that's, yeah. that doesn't happen overnight so I think that we need to have some type of a strategy uh, and that's going to take some time to develop but isn't isn't it also that this is happening not just to our district I mean we talked about that earlier that is that still this is our district it's our i mean this is with our the, with the insurance increase. i mean i know we i know that that's a part of it, that's definitely a big chunk of it but so Abby, at one point you you meant you touched on that other so, districts are feeling this so yeah so there, there's a component so trend is you know eight to nine percent mm -hmm. and that's something that all districts could face assuming that they are kind of in on an average year and so when you look at the multi-year budget eight to nine percent in a budget where you're trying to stay in a three to four percent assessment rate right. is a really tough thing to sustain over time no question right having said that we're dealing with um what is it 28 plus 14 is uh what is that 42 mm -hmm. divided by two years it's a 21 percent so we're so far above that eight percent and that's a district merSD thing and it's not an merSD thing because our program is too rich because we restructured our benefits only two or three years ago to fund OPEB, which almost no other regional school district is doing. Right. But it is an MERSD thing in that we're paying for the claims that we've, uh, you know, um, encountered. So, that but there's a component that is that's much bigger than the component. Right, right, right. But but in fairness, if you were looking at a town like Ipswich. Their health insurance is covered by the town. It's not necessarily just the districts. Do you know what I mean? So yes, for regional true. school districts, you're carrying that cost and that risk mm -hmm. and that. And that strategy. Yeah. yeah that's and I think other, <coughs> other, I'm sure in town-based school systems, when they talk about the budget, the town talks to them about the health care costs that are associated with mm -hmm. their employees because their employees are a big part of their health care costs. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that it's something that only regionals have to deal with. No, but you, but but the town owns it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like the town feels it's their. They own the. the I, I hear where you're. I hear where you're going, and to some extent, that comes down to. I know the FinCons, whatever element of the FinCons that are fiscally conservative, say, oh, we can't come up with extra amount of money. At the end of the day, the school committee is for the district, not exists to answer the district, not necessarily the FinCons. So the school committee says. Hey, sorry, we level service budget, we cut half a million dollars out, and the issue is is something that we have zero control over has gone up by X amount. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, residents of the town or the district, somebody's gonna either cover the costs or, or cut back. So either it's this year's the first year we're going to negative services budget, or here's where we are with what we have to do to get through the, this hurdle. And I know the think will have some people on the think will have a cow about it, but mm -hmm. 
So um, thank you for that work. You're welcome. Can I show you one more thing? Oh, please. Is it good news or bad news? It's, it's an attempt to answer the question about what are our mandated costs. And I think I'm really, we did the best we could, but I don't know if it, it's clear. Because I think what we're trying to show is there are things that are mandated, but frequently it's not, you know, how you do it isn't mandated, but what you do is. So what we tried to do was show what was mandated clean and then what is mandated but then has variations based on what's standard for a Massachusetts district or, or our high performing peer group or does it go to the, it's just something we do because we have to have and there really wasn't anything that fell into that category. Um, That's good. Yeah, I think we, we run it we run a pretty standard operation. Well, that's why our per people is that's, where it is, is yeah, because you know, we're not like the it's only good for people to see that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, what we did was took all of the staffing and tried to break it out by category. Um, so, if you think of the core academic program, so our basic academic um, reading, you know, the, the 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 five required courses, basically the mass what they call the mass core required for kids to get into school. We're required to have enough staffing, we just talked about how the schedule rolls, to have 180 days of school and 906 hour, 990 hours of instruction at the middle high school and 960 hours of instruction at the elementary. So that's basically five and a half hours of a six and a half hour day where kids have to be engaged in direct instruction. So to do that, we hire staff because kids need to be taught by staff. So it takes 37.2% 30, of our budget is dedicated to staff just to fulfill the core program. Now, part of the core program also includes, as you go along, the option to have specials, exploratory, AP, and elective programs. It is not a, an MERSD special to have AP classes at the high school, but it's not mandated that we do. So that's something you could take away if you wanted to, um, to reduce costs. Kids would not have, we would, the more we reduce elective programs, AP, exploratory, and specials, the more we're in jeopardy of not hitting the 990 or 960 mandated hours by the state. So they could investigate us. I don't know, I don't know if anybody ever got a fine for, for it, but we could run into some issues with the state in not fulfilling the educational programs of students. So the more high-performing districts get into things like we have like a expanded STEM offerings, some districts offer class size guidelines that run in our range of one to one to 22 students and many of us are at the point of not um, charging kids for full day K. Most districts have full day K and fewer and fewer but some still charge for it. So taking things out of the column standard for Massachusetts district isn't really possible. You start to degrade our program so that we will no longer be a highly rated school district, which will affect the property values of our towns, and it's the dog wagging the tail. I think you degrade the program where you become non-compliant. Yeah. Because starting to chip away at those things actually starts to undercut the piece, the piece that is mandated, if that makes sense. It's almost like it's all one lump. Right. But it's not, but it, but if you can't hit your 960, and that's your way to get there, then it kind of is. So that's where I get into like too many details to just make it simple. So then if you take out special, everything in the special education bucket, that's mandated. There's very few things to even put in the standard or high performing side. Um, so the staff is based on the number of kids that we have on IEPs to create caseloads, which are in the 15 to 25 student bracket or a specialized program designed to keep kids in district to manage the out of district number. So between staffing is 14% of the budget, transportation is 1.7%, transportation is required. Um, that's a direct mandate. Out of district placements, um, they're mandated. If the kid's profile requi requires it, it is the right thing to do to provide that service to the student. Um, that makes up 3% of our budget. Pre K, that's another one that's kind of a mandate, but kind of not. We're required to provide special education services for all students ages three to five. Um, most districts try to achieve that by having an in-house program instead of starting students at age three without a district services. Um, we are a community fee-based program, but it's very small. 
Uh, moving right along, social emotional learning is its own bucket. Social emotional learning and student supports do have mandates out of the state, um, and it's primarily in staffing to provide counseling services. Something that is, I think, a mark of the high performing districts and where we strive to be is we did um, move to add a guidance counselor a few years back to ensure low ratio college counseling. The parents wanted it. Mm -hmm. They were in here. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think that's pretty typical of, you know, other high performing districts or like mm -hmm. demographic districts. So I don't think we're out on a limb there. But that's 2.6% of the budget for staffing that. And that's our adjustment counselors are in there as well. Um, and Does then that say low ratio? Mm -hmm. We have low ratio college counseling staffing. Few I, number of staff. I know what it means. I think low is not. When we looked at the numbers, I don't think. Well, we have three high school guidance counselors for 450 students. That's pretty low ratio. Comparably. Yeah, I thought when we looked at it, it that to the didn't state. qualify as low. I don't. If you, it, it's lower than most who run in the four to five. It's lower than standard for districts. If you look at the yeah, average okay. school district, but it's, it's not low to compared to our comparables. That's, I, that's what I'm saying. So I don't know that I would label it low. So it's, column D would be low ratio. Column C is some type of college counseling services. Yeah, okay. I think the typical, like, the typical would be, we, a typical school our size would have one or two counselors. College counselors. But it, I don't think it's uncommon in a, to have one to 300. Okay. Because their college counseling load is really a third of the senior class. So that's probably about 35 students. Mm -hmm. Because so many use outside people? Because we only have 120 students. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> no, but they're also helping the other. That's not their own yeah, job. Yeah, I'm just saying, I think I will come back they're to actual statistics. The other actual yes. uh, guidance counselor caseloads are easily in the 250 range as a standard. Um, so transportation, this is just our district transportation, separate of special education, 1.5%. That is mandated because we are a regional district except for within the one and a half mile, and we already charge for that, and we're looking to eliminate it. Um, health services, that would be nursing. We are required to have nurses at each school. We also have a school doctor that gets a nominal um, stipend, but that's 1% of the budget. That can't be removed. Um, the maintenance department, I, we didn't put a little, we didn't put much color commentary, but it's 6%, that's all in staff and um, supplies, materials, etc. I think you have assets like the buildings, they have to be warm, they have to have the lights on, they have to be clean. Um, do utilities fall in that bucket? They do. Great. Yeah. So I don't, what about so? Will the solar go in that bucket? Solar will decrease that bucket. It'll decrease it. By like 10,000. Not a lot. 11. Did you see that? It yeah. just <laughs> got levied. I, know, I, I did, did, by the yeah. way. So, yeah. When we get so yeah, I hope ours don't come from Yeah, me too. I was well, I can get that. When we get to the solar update, it'll be quick, okay. but I can't get into that. So, sure. network yeah. technology is less than a percent of the budget. That's staffing and um, hardware supplies, professional development is less than 1% of the budget. That is mandated by the state. I, I want to say we're supposed to spend 3%, so I think we need to look at that number. Um, but we are required to provide no cost training for teachers so that they can maintain certification. In food service, we're required to have a food service program that's already off the books in a revolving account and a contract. So not a lot to find there. Extra, the extracurricular activities are not mandated. But everybody has them to some degree, and what we just tried to show was that the degree to which people have have them, we could do pages on this. Everyone has a, the standard bucket of activities, and I can give some examples when we're in a, in a different group, and interscholastic athletics. I think what happens in the higher performing districts or the our demographic like, demographically like districts is there's community demand for more um, activities that reflect the community values or interests, things like debate and robotics, or in athletics, specialized uh, teams like skiing and sailing. Um, that's not a typical 
necessarily a typical sport. I think ski is more club. Um, sailing is definitely, it's not, we're, we're not out there on our own, but it's kind of a, a specialty sport. And I did put MS, interschool, middle school, interschool, interscholastic athletics as being something leaning toward we're probably getting toward it being more unique than not to have that. Um, and then administrative costs are 3% of the budget, and that includes um, print, did we, is that number right? Yeah. Um, principals, the district directors, superintendent, AP, and department heads are pretty typical mm -hmm. fare. And then larger districts have more of an expanded middle main. It's more the larger district than the high-performing district that has a, a higher level of the middle management positions. Things like when we talked about when Nancy O'Neill was here, where they have an entire K-12 administrative level person dedicated to oversight of health, wellness, and athletics. Um, mm -hmm. I think that becomes more a function of numbers from my experience, but we could also we could do a deeper dive. And then you've got to have an auditor, accountant, and a treasurer. Um, the thing, let me go back to the administrative thing for a minute. That's another thing, like there's no, I can't find a regulation that says a building has to have a principal, but there are regulations that all the teachers have to be evaluated. Oh. Uh. So, and the people that do the evaluations have to be certified administrators. So, you could have one principal for two buildings, so how many principals you have and how you organize them, I think is up to a district to determine, but you have to have somebody in that seat certified and qualified to perform all of our compliance tasks for the state, and there are many. Do principals ever have more than one building? I would not recommend it, but I think you could do that. Yeah. But I would say but that's standard in Massachusetts is one, one principal, one, one building, building, unless it's a combined facility. So that would be yeah. less than column six. And then you add in, like, B, principals yeah. have to be evaluated, and that gets to the second level of um, the superintendent's role. Um, you have to have a business manager to at least perform the basic accounting and compliance. So we don't have anything really that's, there's nothing that's kind of over here that we are doing unique and different that has mm -hmm. a, a price tag attached to it. And as we see by the final numbers for pupil costs and teacher mm -hmm. um, salaries are Average. right in the middle. So let's talk about how we're going to frame what, what, what do you need from us tonight about budget? We, we, what we I want to do is yeah. send this to you, because we're going to try to use it tomorrow night when we go to FinCom. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it makes sense, if, it, if it's too confusing. Well, well, just what I think at the top from line 32 up is 72% of the budget. Roughly 72 to 75%. Mm -hmm. So 21% is subject to negotiation. So this should, should this all add up to 100%? It should. Okay. It does, I mean, there are some smaller, yes. smaller categories we don't, but this is the essence of it. It's like, I think we're about 97%. Don't forget, it, there's a bunch that are below 1% and get out of those. And we'll too. double check because we moved some numbers around and I don't know if we moved everything into the administrative line that we're So, to. can we, we talk we about this up. about tomorrow night? Because you're giving a presentation to the uh, Manchester FinCom that you're not, that we're not giving to the Essex FinCom. Is that what they wanted? Is this what they asked for? Or do they just want to talk about, what do they want to talk about? They want to talk about our budget, but they did ask for this. They asked for what? They asked to, for us to show them what part of our budget is mandated. Do we need to go into this much? I mean, I, re I mean, really, because we, we have four meetings this yeah. week. I, I don't know if we need to get into this level of discussion. This just took at least 45, and they're going to have other questions that they have for us. So, should we have that in our back pocket kind of thing? Well, I know that the person who's asking for it won't be at the meeting tomorrow night. That helps anybody. <laughs> that does uh, help. Keep in the back pocket. But I don't think he's the only one that's asking for it at this point. I think oh, the bottom line of the subject to negotiation line makes me nervous as one of the people going into negotiations because I'm a little afraid that the FinCom might look at that and say, slash it. Yeah, cool. we'll figure that out. It's subject to negotiation. Well, this we is, don't want you to be there. This is where we're at. This is what our peer districts have. Mm -hmm. right. okay. So that makes a point of, right. hey, you're already we're, below what the market is paying. Right. Okay. No, we're 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 with the we were in the seventy to seventy five rate. Yeah, that's what he, I'm saying. Where, where, that but I'm saying when I take the, oh. the high performing districts off your comparables yeah. page, mm -hmm. they're right. here. Yeah, and the teacher. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. 
And that's probably I mean, the, the reason for the, request, for the request was to show people that we don't have, don't a, lot of, don't have a lot of flexibility and that we are not spendthrifts and we are not padding and, yeah. So if so you can show that, I think it's a, absolutely you should. So it, the last absolutely. bucket should be called the double whammy because it's <laughs> mandated and it's subject to negotiation. So it's, it's going to take us a year. So what we just talked about before. We can't solve the actual problem because we're going to have to go and work with other people to get there. But by state law, we got to provide at least 50-50, so it can't go any lower than that. We're already at 70, 75. There's wiggle room to come down. That's where we're, what we're going to discuss. But to be at standard, we'd be going to 60-40, and yes, probably the GIC. Maya isn't a bad thing. It's you know it's a cooperative, so we can we were in it, we've been out, we can go back in. And then if you look at teacher salaries, it's negotiable. Everybody has experience in education-based step and scale, and we're falling, what, 111, 123, something like that on the scale? So we're in the middle and we're at state average. I just so don't think there's the, the will of the them. school committee to beat the teachers up on health care mm -hmm. and salary. Mm -hmm. I hope not. I don't don't beat, I don't but I don't think that. it's beat no. the... I don't think that's what it is. I mm -hmm. think we're... Obviously, the situation we're in is not sustainable when it comes to health care. If you can have a year where we get a wrench thrown in the process, mm -hmm. and now we're looking at heads and program as the only yeah. way to get to where we need to go. We're back at where we were two years ago. Yeah. Well, I think ago. that's mm -hmm. what we need to talk about yes. on Thursday, we, is we need help from the state. Yeah. The, the state will state move slower than negotiation. Yeah. 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 No, I know. So let me, yeah. let me just throw another, just another very different perspective that yeah. I see in residents as what comes up in town. In Manchester especially, I can't speak to Essex, there's this, geez, we don't have policemen or firefighters in town anymore. And so we're having to pay higher rates. We're having to go out and try and fulfill that. To some extent, I would be curious if you were to look at, say, what percentage of the people employed by the district can afford to live in the district. That would be... What? I'm following you now. No, so, I, so I'm like, I think it would say, geez, you know what, we are in some ways, they're keeping that low is because these aren't necessarily local people and we do have to be competitive and it isn't that, oh, this is an easy, I roll out of, the, I roll out of bed and I come down the street and I'm at, from, from the majority of the people, it's people are coming from all around for, mm -hmm. to work here and it's a living wage and that's, yeah. So I'm with you in terms of I don't think it's beating mm -hmm. up about. Well, I just don't and that's want a step that in scale rate. Right, just FinCom. to clarify, because they will the actually FinCom, make their health care worse. Listen, the, you know the FinCom can can share their thoughts. This is we. This is, we, this that's is our, what I'm saying. Yeah. I yeah. don't think it's the will of the no, school committee. No, and the committee. Yeah. 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 The are, negotiate are, hard on health care and salary. Yeah, yeah. we're not the because it's the comparables really speak very loudly to all these issues. And so you can't get around the fact that people are going to be curious about these things, and I think it's important for us to share the information. Yeah, but at the end of the day, I think the comparables are the outcome that anyone who asks a question like that would be looking for. Yeah. And I think someone is, it's unlikely that someone's going to say, okay, let's try to move average teacher salary to like 180 to 250 range, and let's take our you know, per pupil expenditure and bring that down to 150. I mean, no one's going to say that. So I think we have a lot of data that really helps. The question is, at the end of the day, you know. But we had a FinCom member say, could we come in and negotiate with you? Yeah. And I want them to know, we're not bad no. negotiators. We have a difference of opinion. Well, That's they, are not, point. they are not elected to serve the by the residents of the district right. to serve the district. They're also not elected. They're appointed. <laughs> I do. So, I both. <laughs> and they're not elected. Yeah. We, we didn't kiss the ring one year. And I do believe we have to. But more importantly, what I think, we, we have support from our parents. Yes. They do not come to the meeting. If they don't they come, come if call. we don't go and kiss the ring and get some of those FinCom people a little bit more on our side, and our school parents don't show up, we will be in trouble at town meeting this year. Mm -hmm. Absolutely on the floor yeah. with the FinCom. So we have, to, we have to really focus on getting the parents to come. Well, well that's... Instead of like... And that goes go through the motions here, but we have to somehow get parents to know that this is well. It bothers me that we have no other FinCom members here tonight when we're talking about budget. We're talking about budget all, all January, mm -hmm. yeah. and the only time we ever talk to people is when we go to them. <coughs> really well, and I, I just have I, I have to say we talk about it for several months, so I get why it's the we have trust, we have faith in you. Come to us, you know, when you go, and I, I look at that as you don't have to be monitored at each and every meeting to make sure we don't miss something. But I agree. What? Nothing. That's okay. not it. 
They want us to come to that. Avi, I say bring this tomorrow. Yeah. Well, we're Don't go you. through it line, or the other one. Yeah. Don't go through it line by line. Have it there. They've asked for it. Here it is. Oh. That last line you said that. is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. Which last line? Cell C38 versus D38? Yeah. 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 Okay, it's uh, 9 o'clock, and you have some things you want to talk to us about, about this, the, uh, so. I'm going to say them in less than a minute. <laughs> no, 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 but, no, thanks for the work you did on the budget. <laughs> I feel like you'll have to be each other too long. Yeah. We'll be here now. Well, I think everyone wants to go. I, these are things I think you want to know about, yeah. so I'm going to make them incredibly brief. First, we talked about the solar panels. Thank you for your support on that. We can follow the town. Uh, it's time to put them in. As you may remember, everything needs to be completed by March 31st. The tariff that is being proposed, I think, has been passed for solar panels. It happens afterwards. So that's the thing, type of thing that, yes, could not only will the state grant decrease significantly after March 31st, but the cost, those types of things will go up. So that's another reason to just say, hey, we got a great deal, but we got to stay the course. What you will, what you might hear is that we are going to be busy getting those solar panels installed. There are five areas um, over the cafeteria, over the library here, over the auditorium, and then over the high school and the middle school facing southerly direction. Uh, basically, we're, it's going to be at four weeks of doing that work. Uh, we're going through plans with the principals to minimize the impact on instruction. Uh, yes, there will be some times where they'll be coming through uh, with materials from a staging area. We may shut uh, the community entrance at some times. We may close a balcony, little things like that. So it will be visible is really what I'm trying to say to you, that there will be a crew coming through. But we're working with the principals and their site manager on a daily basis. But they, they do this with schools frequently. They do them frequently during session. We don't have the opportunity to do this over the summer. So our goal is to be working hand in hand with them to make sure that we are minimizing the impact. So okay. I just Those wanted to give you a quick check and all that kind of stuff. Hundred percent. Yep, okay. that's been done. Yeah. So that's my update on solar panels. Uh, and then I think I, it is worth mentioning uh, that the town of Essex has included us in our green grant program, as we talked about. There are three projects, uh, and essentially uh, two hundred and fifteen thousand dollars of equipment is through the great collaborative support of the town of Essex going to be put into uh, Essex Elementary School and it has uh, a great benefit to, first of all, we will not pay a penny. The grant will pay for all of it. Um, so we're extremely fortunate. Uh, savings we have in the budget is estimated at 10,000. It could be more than that. There's uh, um, LED lighting. There is a mechanical control system because we have extremely outdated controls for controlling temperature and all that and then some other things called steam trap upgrade which basically makes sure you don't have heat loss in your mechanical system uh, bottom line is uh, between the program and the, and the, uh, the uh, rebates from the uh, utility company we won't pay a penny so we we're extremely fortunate to get something these things typically have payback periods of six to 15 years all things that you might be able to do with Essex Elementary because we're going to have it for a while, but we're going to have a payback period of instantaneous. So it's really amazing, and it's part of the bigger theme, which is we are continuing to either invest or seek out grant opportunities to extend the useful life of, of Essex Elementary. And so this is a great step forward. It addresses some Habib and associate items that were there, mm -hmm. and it, and continues to put us in a position where we don't have a shoe that's about to drop, and much better than that, we're making the building more efficient. So, um, That's my two things. One minute up there. It would be great if um, Jennifer could write something up about that in her, um, whatever her yeah. communication is. Yeah. Um, she can just take a picture of it and post it on her blog. That's a well, single yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, that's Pardon? A, she's, she's housing it, but it's all happening. It's a, it's but a, it would be great if it went in her newsletter we'll for Essex parents to read. Yeah. Us to put everywhere. Yes, yeah. us to put everywhere. And yeah. um, the other thing is I would love or if we could get the Gloucester Daily Times to talk about how um, the district has partnered with the two towns on these green grants and where we're seeing the savings and the, you know what I mean? I think yeah. that that's a good story. Yep. Okay. Um, Mary, maybe Mary would be interested in doing something on yeah. that. Yeah. Is there a green team program still happening? Mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. the, maybe the green team just could be part of that. Like learning about it and talking to the paper. Mm -hmm. There's a lot to learn about. 
We'll be having a green team representative at our next meeting. Awesome. Oh, good. Talk about greenhouses. I love greenhouses. Our next meeting's in Essex. Oh. I'd say we start at 6 and hold the public hearing at 7. That way there we can do the bit of business we might have ahead of time. Which date? Next Tuesday. Next one. Okay. So we have, um, let's just talk about meetings next week. We have a Tuesday night meeting in Essex. We're start you said at start people. at 6? People. Yeah. I've always wanted to do that. Um, <laughs> Class. Eyes up here. Um, uh, Tuesday meeting in Essex. Wednesday night is... Community forum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What other meetings do we have next week? We have a Thursday night's building or um, building, building committee. on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week. Do we have anything on Monday night? No. 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 This week. <laughs> 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 Never. Thursday night. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Something will find its way in. Yeah, I'm I know. Sure at this point. Yeah. But. Okay. Great. All right. So is that so, is that all we got? Thursday. Tuesday is the thirtieth. Right. Yep. We have a okay. build, we have yep. school committee on Tuesday. Yep. yep. We have building committee community forum. The thirty first. The thirty first. And, and then we have a building committee meeting yep. on the first. Mm -hmm. And then we have another building committee meeting on the fifth. And Friday's Groundhog Day. Friday. So it can happen all over again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what is our collaborative meeting? Tuesday morning. Mm -hmm. Tuesday. Okay. Morning. Yeah. Okay. And and the the building committee meetings are becoming more and more eventful. So I encourage anyone to come. Yeah. Yeah, they're interesting. Is your booze? Just no. kidding. <laughs> you really wouldn't want that crowd to have booze. That uh, could be fun. Let's bring some booze. But this yeah. is cool to me. Yeah. Okay. Um, anything else? I meant to say, are you serving Any snacks? other public comment? <laughs> All those in uh, motion, motion to adjourn. Motion so to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, everybody.